So thank you everyone for coming today. We really appreciate your attendance. And I wanna say thank you to Tina Nguyen and the organizers who organized the meeting. We're so proud of the knowledge that's been gained across many countries and many countries are represented today in the area of a very important research topic, which is looking at the future of food allergy prevention. As we know, this is a huge epidemic and we're dealing with a pandemic of infectious disease, but this epidemic has been in our world and is increasing and we need to understand how to prevent it. So I really wanna thank the moderators, the speakers. At the end of today, you will hopefully have a lot of questions that are answered, but importantly is we don't have all the answers and we want you to feel free to ask us questions and that will be possible with the Q&A section of the webinar. So please feel free to type in your questions during the panelist talks, and then the moderator will review those questions and read them. If we don't have enough time in the end, we might go a little bit into our breaks, but I'll try to make sure that we break on time. Everyone needs a little bit of uh, room to be able to get up and exercise or, uh, or, or, or go um, do other things. So we really want this to be a wonderful symposium that's interactive. Please know that there are um, recordings going on. And with that recording, we'll be able to send you a link once we're done with the session. If anyone's questions are not answered, we'll take them down in the question and answer, and then we'll try to send them to the speaker and we'll send you back an email with some answers. So we really want this to be something that is a build. And this is the first one that we're having out of Stanford through the symposium, but we're hoping to do it annually. And we're really excited to be able to have a preeminent array of moderators and speakers here today. So I'll end my talking and I'll let Gideon now introduce the three speakers for this session, which is called the Pathways to Understanding Causes of Food Allergy. Thank you. Dr. Lack. Uh, thank you, Dr. Nadeau. Uh, it really is my pleasure to uh, chair this uh, uh, very important uh, symposium uh, and uh, Pathways to Understanding Causes of Food Allergy and Prevention are very close to my heart. Um, it gives me no greater pleasure than to introduce our very first speaker, Dr. Carrie Nadeau uh, from Stanford University, um, who will, um, unless um, that was your introduction already. Yes, that's correct. That's fine. Okay. You can move forward. It's great. So I can move forward. Great. We. So it uh, gives me equally uh, great pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Helen Bruff, uh, King's College London. She will be talking about targeting the skin for allergy prevention. Uh, Dr. Braff, over to you. Thank you very much, Professor Lack. I'm going to start um, sharing my screen. I hope everybody can see that. And thank you so much to uh, all the organizers, to uh, Professor Nadeau and to Tina Nguyen and all the organizers for inviting me to speak today. I'm delighted to be part of this eminent crowd of uh, speakers today at this symposium. I'm going to be talking today about targeting the skin for allergy prevention, uh, which is very much centered around a lot of the work that we've done building up to the Stopping Eczema and Allergy Study. These are my conflicts of interest. So I'm going to start with a brief summary of the environmental and genetic factors that we know lead to epicutaneous damage. So this is a review that was done last year with the same group that is working on the SEAL study. And we know that detergents can break down the skin barrier and also the gut. Uh, and these are commonly available in our dishwashers and washing machines. High pH creams are often used on the children with the most sensitive skin, and they've also been shown to increase proteases of the skin and disrupt the skin barrier. There are genetic predisposition factors such as filagrin, loracrin, and SPINK5, and these are all um, laying down the foundation that increases the susceptibility towards epicutaneous damage. 
Then there are certain other environmental factors such as um, pathogens, viruses, bacteria, particularly Staph aureus toxins and fungi such as Malassezia that also disrupt the skin barrier. And uh, some evidence has also shown that exposure to environmental peanut can increase the risk of peanut allergy in children with filaggrin mutations or with eczema. So what can be done about this? This is a chapter that's been accepted for publication, which is looking at precisely uh, all the different uh, arguments behind this. So on the left, you can see a diagram of this uh, predisposing condition. You can see the stratum corneum is broken down with the keratinocytes uh, not firmly put together because the natural moisturizing factor has gone. Then you have disrupting elements such as detergents and chemicals, allergen influx, and this then leads to an inflammatory T cell response initiated by keratinocytes and dendritic cells. What if we could do a really simple uh, intervention, putting a particular type of cream onto the skin that would then improve the skin barrier improve this dysfunction and block the allergen influx and thereafter the inflammatory cascade. This is a Cochrane study which looked uh, at the realm of different studies that have now looked at this. Initially, there were some exciting pilot data which seemed to suggest that early application of petrolatum-based moisturizers onto the skin could prevent the development of eczema. But unfortunately, since then, there have been several large conducted trials, some of which um, in the thousands, that have unfortunately shown that there is no uh, significant improvement in eczema or in the prevention of food allergy using this intervention. Uh, and you can see here, for example, the Chalmers 2020 is the BEEP study, the Barrier Enhancement and Eczema Prevention Study, and the Skirvin 2020 study is the Prevent Adal study. Why is this? There's a very recent paper that looked at the EAT study children, and this was a, a retrospective analysis of data that was available in the EAT study. And what was very interesting was that there was an association between the frequent moisturizer use in early infancy and the development of food allergy. What we found that was very surprising was that a very large proportion of children were having emollients applied onto their skin, even if they did not have eczema. So almost 71% of babies with no visible eczema at three months were receiving emollients at least once a week. And this was predominantly for baby massage. Those children that did have visible eczema at three months had um, almost 90% application of moisturizers once a week. Just going back here, you can see that those who had moisturizers applied once a week had a rate of food allergy of around 3%, whereas those who had moisturizers applied more than daily had a food allergy risk of over 30%. These are the moisturizers that were used in the different groups. You can see that in both the groups with and without visible eczema, olive oil was the predominant moisturizer use. And this is because still in uh, many maternity units, they are advised to use olive oil as the first moisturizer. Then in the children without eczema, Johnson's baby oil was used. And in those with eczema thereafter, it was diprobase and double base and aqueous cream. So why is this uh, potentially associated? The first thing that might be thought about was that this could be due to a dose response between eczema severity and moisturizing frequency. However, this analysis was adjusted for eczema severity and for lagrin status. Another argument would be that infants who had moisturizers applied had eczema or dry skin before enrollment. However, this association uh, persisted even when infants whose parents with reported or eczema or dry skin before enrollment were excluded. Is this because these moisturizers were damaging the skin barrier? So we know from this study that the transepidermal water loss also increased with each application of moisturizer. And we know that olive oil, which was the top moisturizer applied in children with and without eczema, such as vegetable oils in other forms can impede the development of lamella structures of the skin. 
And we also know that certain creams that contain sodium laurel sulfate, such as aqueous cream, which was used in the eczema group in around 18% of children, also disrupt the skin barrier. There might also be the hypothesis that certain oils can facilitate the transfer of allergen to the skin because in mouse models, oils have been shown to facilitate the penetration of a model chemical. What about other creams? This was a study that was led by Tina Cinder and the group, and she was looking at the transurbidermal water loss between petrolatum-based moisturizers, such as Abino, and a trilipid, which contains ceramides, free fatty acids, and cholesterol. So in this study, there were 45 children with dry skin or eczema between three months and seven years of age. They had uh, internal control as they had the left or right heart applied. And this was applied and applied for five weeks. And you can see here that the transepidermal water loss with Avino had reduced, but it was um, not down to normal levels of chul. Whereas after the Episeram being used for five weeks, chul levels had reduced significantly more than with Avino, and these were down to normal levels of chul in the skin. Subsequently, this was a study that was done with total body application or of either Avino or Episeram, a trilipid cream. This was performed in 16 infants, four to nine months of age with atopic dermatitis or dry skin. And this was applied for 12 weeks of total body application. You can see here the IgG4 to IgE ratios. And you can see that in Avino, these went down after week 12 and in Episeram, they went up. This was because the Avino group actually had an increase in IgE versus the trilipid arm had a decrease in IgE, and there was a moderate uh, improvement or increase in IgG4 in the Episeram arm. And similar patterns were found for specific IgE and specific IgG4 to peanut. Moving on to a study that looked at a trilipid emollient, the Pebbles pilot study, you can see here that they looked at the children that were able to apply the Episeram in the intention to treat group, which was 34, and the Episeram in the PER protocol group, which was 21. And of these, you can see that after six, synthesization at 12 months, after six months of application of these moisturizers, was 8.8% um, in the intention to treat group. But in those children that were able to apply the Episeram at least five days a week, there was zero sensitization to any food, which includes milk, egg, and peanut. So what does this show? Essentially, moisturizers and the prevention of AD and food allergy show that petrolatum-based moisturizers, there's no effect for AD prevention, severity, or time to onset. In the BEEP study, there was actually an increase in skin infections. And in the BEEP study also, there was a trend towards sensitization and food allergy in the children that had petrolatum-based moisturizers applied. In the EAT study, we showed that moisturizer frequency was associated with food allergy, but this was predominantly olive oil used for baby massage. And then there is a study that is being conducted in Australia looking at the Pebbles um, pilot study moving forward into a larger group of children, 760 high-risk infants. Finally, I'm going to talk about early proactive topical steroids associated with reduced food allergy. This was a retrofect study which looked at children who had either proactive steroid use started from four months duration of eczema or over four months duration of eczema. Proactive steroid use meant using topical steroids twice a week for two weeks and thereafter, um, sorry, twice a day for two weeks and thereafter two times weekly to prevent recurrence of eczema flares and to treat subclinical inflammation. In the children that had this treatment started before four months, there was a 45% reduction in food allergy by two years of age, which included egg, milk, wheat, soy, peanut and fish. More importantly, those children that had already sensitization to egg, there was a 60% reduction in egg allergy in the children that had proactive steroid treatments. And this study is now being looked into in Japan, looking at twice daily emollient therapy 
with hyroidoid soft ointment from seven to 13 weeks and proactive steroid treatment from seven to 13 weeks, twice a day for two weeks and then twice weekly. This is with a low potency steroid to the face and intermediate potency to the body. And the outcome will be food challenge at six months to egg. Finally, um, the culmination of all this work is the SEAL study, Stopping Eczema and Allergy, that I'm very, very excited to be part of. We're going to be uh, incorporating, uh, this is a multi-center study uh, with Stanford and Denver and Chicago and London, uh, with Stanford as the sponsor and uh, NIH funded study, where we're going to be bringing into this study all of the different work that has been done with a trilipid uh, pilot work that we did to see whether this is any better than a petrolatum based moisturizer and with the use of proactive topical steroid in the form of pluticasone propionate cream. And we'll be screening children from um, zero to 12 weeks now, this has been amended. And then there will be two interventions of either a trilipid cream and proactive pluticasone propionate or the abino cream and uh, proactive topical steroids or reactive care where the child will be referred to their primary care physician. There will be a 12 month skin prick test interim analysis and the primary analysis at the end of the study will be food allergy by 36 months to um, egg, cow's milk, peanuts, sesame, fish, wheat, and five tree nuts by Food Challenge. I'd like to thank you all for your attention and I'd like to thank all the different um, people that I've been working with together on these projects. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Dr. Brath. Um, there will be time for questions at the end and uh, I'm delighted to introduce our next speaker, uh, Dr. Don Lee Jung, uh, National Jewish Health, who will be talking to us about skin barrier dysfunction in food allergy. Thank you, Gideon. It's a pleasure to be here and uh, an honor to present at this uh, distinguished symposium. Uh, do you see my slides, uh, Gideon? We do, yeah. And these are my disclosures. All the work that I will present was funded by NIAID as part of our atopic dermatitis research network that I'm PI on. And just to take off on Helen's wonderful talk, uh, it's been known for a very long time that there's an association between food allergy and atopic dermatitis. And this has been shown by uh, many people uh, and really the issue that I'd like to discuss is not only that creams are different and patient's skin respond differently to different creams, but there may be differences in the skin barrier of patients with or without food allergy. It's postulated that skin barrier dysfunction is a main driver of atopic dermatitis as well as food allergy, but we don't have any really objective measures to separate these two skin conditions if they exist. And so we developed almost a decade ago now, uh, a skin tape method, which is non-invasive and not scarring com in comparison to skin biopsies. Uh, that could be used to identify different atopic dermatitis phenotypes. I'm showing you data that uh, was accumulated after doing 20 skin tape strips, which is tolerable even down into young infancy. But we now know that even with four or five tape strips, we can distinguish different uh, atopic dermatitis phenotypes. And uh, an important point I just want to raise is, is the fact that when you do 20 tape strips, you literally do remove the entire stratum corneum or quantified envelope of the dead skin, but you also take off the upper granular layer of the skin where there are nucleated cells, and therefore you can do uh, a complete lipid and protein profile of the skin, as well as look at their transcriptome. And so this is a, a paper that we published in Science Translational Medicine 
uh, comparing uh, in the blue line, what you can see is atopic dermatitis with food allergy. These are patients who mainly had peanut allergy. All of them had peanut allergy. The red uh, line here are atopic dermatitis without food allergy. So roughly, as a reminder, 40% of people with atopic dermatitis get peanut allergy, but 60% do not. And we were asking the question, is there a physiologic difference in transepidermal water loss between atopic dermatitis with and without food allergy? And the green line for comparison are the non-atopics. And what you can see is the blue line shows a increasing amount of water loss with serial skin tape stripping um, of these three groups. Now, work uh, particularly in the UK, but also in the United States and worldwide has now shown that flagrant mutations are strongly associated with peanut allergy as well as atopic dermatitis. The terminal amino acid which is also called natural moisturizing factor, uh, which may be very important in terms of driving the dryness that we see in people who get atopic dermatitis with food allergy is very different uh, between these three groups. This orange bar are patients of atopic dermatitis with food allergy, and you can see they have a significantly lower almost not even overlapping with the other group with atopic dermatitis, but no food allergy. And both groups are lower than the green bar, which are non-atopics. So this is very interesting to me because of a comment that Gideon Lack made to me probably last year that he thinks dryness of the skin is a very early feature even before you develop atopic dermatitis, an early feature of peanut allergy. And this really supports that clinical observation since uricanic acid is a moisturizing factor that traps moisture from the environment. And if you have the absence of uricanic acid, then you will have very dry skin, which is a feature as well of people with flavor mutations. Now, Although the focus of much of the research on the skin has been on proteins, uh, through a collaboration with Eva Gina Berdyshev at National Jewish Health, we've been able to look at lipids in the skin. And it's uh, very well established by Peter Elias at UCSF that the lipid structure in non-atopics is very well organized and periodic and uh, mass spec evaluation has shown that these lipids are very unique to the skin. They're ultra long chain hydrophobic fatty acids. And as you know, oil and water do not mix. So the longer chain lipids will trap moisture in the skin. This is very different. Now this on the left is electron microscopy on the skin tape, which Pete Elias collaborated with us on. And you can see if seeing is believing that non-atopics have very well organized lipid lamella membranes. This is totally disrupted, disorganized in atopic dermatitis with food allergy. And additional mass spec data that we published in JCI had shown in fact that these lipids are short and probably inadequate to trap moisture uh, in the skin. And this is really a premise for why one might want to add lipids back into the skin. Something that is really still evolving, but very exciting, is that people with atopic dermatitis and food allergy, and this is still from a STM paper, have a different reaction to scratching and itching than people who have run at a mill atopic dermatitis without food allergy. You can see that, and you don't have to be a scientist to appreciate that the slope of this curve on the left is very different than the slope of the curve on the right. 
And basically, uh, one sees accelerated increased transeptoderm water loss here on the left as the itching goes up. But this is not the case. So in the atopic dermatitis without food allergy. So there's very reactive skin going on when you have food allergy. And if you scratch, professors, for example, Gideon Lack, when he trained at National Jewish as a fellow, we used to go on the PCU and tell patients, don't scratch because it's bad for you. Well, this is particularly bad for people with food allergy because it's very disruptive. And almost at the same time that we published the STM paper, Raif Jahad's group uh, looked at a mouse model of scratching, and this was published in Immunity. And what they found is when they scratched vigorously or mechanically injured the epidermis of mice, that IO-33 was being released. And it worked on the innate lymphoid cells in the intestine, uh, leading to mast cell hyperplasia. And uh, interestingly enough, uh, increased mediated release and experimental anaphylaxis on exposure to peanut. So I think the bottom line there is the skin communicates with the gut. And we're seeing this as being true uh, in both the microbiome, particularly if you apply a microbiome that can injure the skin, or even in the gut, there is unpublished data that gut inflammation can alter the skin uh, immune response. And that's work that really needs to be teased out more, I think, in the future. Now, I told you that the transcriptome can be evaluated from the skin tape. And in fact, if you look again at the orange bar in atopic dermatitis with food allergy, what you can see is looking at a principal component that is enriched for type 2 immune activation, and that's things like IL-4 receptor, CCL-17 or CCL-22, or IL-13, that one sees that atopic dermatitis with food allergy has a very high type 2 immune activation, whereas atopic dermatitis without food allergy still has a higher type 2 immune activation than normals, which are the green bar, but it's still less than food allergy. So one thing I, I want to mention to you is to look here at the right panel. The left panel did skin tape stripping on non-lesional skin. So normal looking skin to the clinical clinician's eye. The focus of most of our research has been on the skin lesion, which is shown, the transcriptome shown on the right. But that's very interesting because not surprisingly, skin lesions have very high type two immune activation. But what is totally surprising is that non-lesional skin from food allergy has just as high a type two immune activation as the skin lesion. As clinicians, we usually focus on treating skin lesions, getting rid of that rash. But what this suggests is that even the non-lesional normal looking skin in a food allergy patient, could be even the cheeks or, or the arms of a patient that may accidentally be putting food all over their skin, that already has a lot of type two immune activation going on. And it suggests that we should be at looking at treating non-lesional skin as well as uh, the rash. So I'm gonna to try to uh, speed up here and try to get back on time. But I wanna just tell you that it's, there is another defect that you should know about in atopic skin, which uh, has to do with the failure to terminally differentiate. Now, this is just a reminder. Normal skin has these four layers, starting with the basal layer, which is where the stem cells are and the keratinocytes are proliferating. These keratinocytes 
express unique differentiation markers, namely curtain five and curtain 14, which is a marker for lack of differentiation. As the keratinocytes percolate up to the top of the skin, normal skin terminally differentiating will make flagrin, lorocrin, and velucrin. Now let's look at skin tape. I told you that we're really only looking at the top surface of the skin. So one would not expect to see keratin-5 or keratin-14 because that's in the basal layer of the uh, skin. But surprisingly, what we saw was that in atopic dermatitis with food allergy, they had the highest level of keratin-5 and 14. Without going into this deeply, what this reflects is the fact that in atopic dermatitis with food allergy, keratinocytes are totally failing to terminally differentiate. And therefore, you have a situation where you have a very defective skin barrier that is probably allowing environmental triggers uh, like allergens or peanut to absorb through the skin. But even more importantly, in the paper that we published almost 20 years ago in the New England Journal of Medicine, we had shown that atopic skin does not make antimicrobial peptides. And that was one of the reasons why Staph aureus proliferates on atopic skin. If you don't terminally differentiate, then you don't make antimicrobial peptides. So that's something for us to talk about later because uh, multiple groups now have shown Staph aureus as a potential trigger of peanut allergy. And so that, that just summarizes what we think is going on in atopic dermatitis is this proliferation compartment with stem cells and undifferentiated keratinocytes has expanded. And as a result, you don't get terminal differentiation. You have a lack of flagrant and Lorikrin, uh, what this suggested to uh, the SEAL group was that one really needed to look at skin barrier protection from birth. But I emphasize the paper that Tina Sinhir um, uh, wrote and that Helen had presented the data from is that not all creams are uh, created equally and therefore we need creams that really protect the skin barrier rather than creams that don't protect the skin barrier. And we believe that a trilipid cream may be most effective based on her observations showing that uh, Epicerem as one example, there may be others that are being developed worldwide uh, that reduce transeptome water loss. Once one gets visible eczema, one needs to control the skin rash quickly, because Gideon Locke's uh, observations in Eden Leap have shown that the longer duration of eczema, the more severity of the eczema predisposes people to peanut allergy. Beyond that, we now know that it, uh, Staph aureus uh, as part of microbial dysbiosis is a driver of the atopic march including peanut allergy. We are doing studies now with Rich Gala at UCSD that was published a few months ago in Nature Medicine, showing in fact a reduction in the commensal or beneficial bacteria and that these bacteria can control Staph aureus. And so that opens up the possibility of targeted microbiome transplantation. What one wants to do is control that eczema long enough so one can do the leap consensus and introduce uh, food allergens early. Once you have breakthrough severe eczema, uh, one idea would be to consider biologics in combination with oral immunotherapy. That is uh, something that's on the docket of the Immune Tolerance Network and NIID still under discussion. Carrie Nadeau is one of the thought leaders uh, on that. And Helen already discussed SEAL, which will be a multi-center study led by Stanford 
uh, and participated by National Jewish King's College London, University of Chicago, to see if the combination approach that I've just discussed uh, would work in preventing food allergy. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Liu. So we'll save our questions till, till later. And uh, it now gives me pleasure to introduce Dr. Caroline uh, Rodwick from University of Zurich, who will discuss the role of microbial mentalities in food allergy prevention. Dr. Rodwick? Yes, thank you very much, uh, Professor Lack. So I'm also very happy uh, to be a part of this uh, symposium today. And first I would like to uh, thank um, Dr. Nado for the invitation. And uh, my talk today is about the role of the microbial metabolites. I should maybe say more the potential role of microbial metabolites in a food allergy uh, prevention. So first we know that uh, nutrition in, uh, is a very important environmental factor, especially in early life, uh, that plays a, an, an important role on the de development of allergic disease. So uh, we have shown from our group, but also our group, other groups have shown that an increased food diversity, uh, in the, especially in the first year of life, could protect against allergic disease. But we also have shown that some single food items like the yogurt or vegetables or food introduced in the first year, first year of life could protect against uh, allergic uh, disease like food allergy. So the topic of my talk is about the microbial metabolites and the most important one are the short chain fatty acid and the most ab abundant one are the acetate, propionate and butyrate. And uh, there is an important link between the short chain fatty acid and the diet because the two main sources of the short chain fatty acid come from the diet. One of the main sources is by eating fiber. So the gut microbiota will metabolize those fibers or so polysaccharide by fermentation, and this will induce the production of those short chain fatty acid. But we also know that um, in certain food, like the butter of yogurt, we find some short chain fatty acids, especially the beauty rate. So it can also come directly from the food. But also why the short chain fatty acid? Because we know they have a very important impact on the immune system. There are very small molecules that can pass the intestinal barrier and they can uh, bind uh, some receptors, these uh, G protein uh, receptors that we find on immune cells. And uh, one of the main mechanisms by uh, when these short chain fatty acids bind these receptors, they will inhibit the histone deacetylase, and this will increase the expression of FOXP3. And this will induce the differentiation of the T uh, na naive T cells in T Rex, and then there will be an increased production of the T Rex, but there will also be an increase of the pro production then of IL 10. So, an increase of the regulatory mechanism through this short chain fatty acid. But we also know that beauty rate play a role uh, in maintaining the intestinal barrier, which can also be important when we talk about uh, food allergy prevention. So in the, in the past study, which is a birth court, a large birth court study conducted in Europe, um, in this study, we looked at the farm environment, uh, especially what kind of uh, factors from this farm, and farm environment could protect against allergic disease. And here we measured among uh, subsamples of 300 children, the short chain fatty acid at the age of uh, one year in the fecal samples. So we found these three major short chain fatty acid, the acetate, propionate, and butyrate at different level. The most abundant one is the acetate, and then comes the propionate and then the butyrate the less abundant one, and this is similar what we find in other, uh, what was found in other uh, human studies. And then we looked at the association between the infant diet and the short chain fatty acid, and here the summary of our results. So we found that there was a, um, a positive association between introduction of yogurt, fish, and also vegetables and fruit in the first year of life, and the level of beauty rate. So the children having uh, who consume yogurt in the first year of life, they have a higher level of beauty rate uh, at the age of one year. But also the children who consume fish compared to the ch children who did not consume fish, they have a higher level of beauty rate. And, it, and some studies have shown that um, uh, when the, 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 the 
you, the person the, who had um, omega-3 rich diet, uh, they, are, they have a, a, an influence on their intestinal microbiota and especially increasing the number of butyrate producing uh, bacteria. So that can be a link how this uh, introduction of fish in the first year of life could uh, have a positive impact on the level of uh, butyrate by this increase of this butyrate producing bacteria. And we didn't find any association with the uh, different food and the other short chain fatty acid like the propionate and acetate. And then we looked at the level of the short chain fatty acid and here uh, atopic uh, sensitization that we measured in blood at the age of six years among those children. And what we found, we found that those, chil those children with a very high level of uh, short chain fatty acid, they are less likely to be sensitized uh, to any of the allergen that we measured at the age of six years. And here we can see that the children having this high level of beauty rate at the 95 or above the 95 percentile, 26 percent of those children uh, are sensitized, but among the children having a lower level of beauty rate, beauty rate so 56 percent are sensitized, so much more children having a sensitization. And also with the level of propionate, we see here an, an, a difference uh, that the children having a high level of propionate, they, have a low, uh, they are less likely sensitized at the age of six years. There was no association with acetate. And here looking at uh, allergic disease, and we also see here with the children having a high level of uh, beauty rate, they are, most, uh, they are less likely to have uh, allergic disease. When we looked at food allergy, clearly less likely to have food allergy up to six years when they have a high level of beauty rate, but also less likely to have a sensitization to food allergen at the age of six years among these children with a high level of beauty rate. So there are not so many studies uh, looking at uh, the level of the short chain fatty acid in early life, especially beauty weight and food allergy. Here the summary of those studies, so I present our data, but there are also two other studies looking at this um, the short chain fatty acid and food allergy. One uh, Canadian study, they already found that at the age of three months, when the children have a low level of short chain fatties of beauty rate, they have an increased risk to develop food allergy later on in life. And also a study from Sweden, they also found that the low level of beauty rate at the age of one year were associated with an increased risk of food allergy at the age of four years. So now I would like also to show you uh, the data, again, the data from the pasture study. And here we looked, uh, we published last year those data, and here we looked at the gut microbiome among those children. We looked at the gut microbiome at the age of two and 12 months of age. And as an outcome, we look at asthma here. And um, it's an it's analysis that were performed by Dr. Deppner and his group, and they did quite complicated analysis, and they try to define the microbial age and to see how mature is the gut microbiota uh, among those children. And they could have this estimated microbial age for all the children from this study. And what they found is that the farmer children have a much more mature gut microbiome, microbiome compared to the non-farmer children. And also they found that children with a higher uh, microbial age, they have a lower risk to uh, develop asthma up to the age of six years. And what defined this more mature gut microbiome um, we could show that those children with a more mature microbiome are mainly defined by a high amount of butyrate producing bacteria, but also this uh, primary degrader that are not um, directly producing butyrate, but also involved in the produ production of butyrate. So again, here the butyrate, butyrate producing bacteria are here uh, clear, um, important to have a mature gut microbiome. And also uh, in this study, we found that there was an inverse association between the level of beauty rate and uh, asthma. So the one, the children have a high level of beauty rate, they have less asthma. So now I showed you some uh, so the data from the human studies, and now I would like to show you data from two studies uh, using mice model. One of these studies that uh, our group performed, we looked at a, an asthma mouse, mouse model, and we tried to have a prevention model by uh, already uh, giving the mice uh, the short chain fatty acid before, uh, before starting the sensitization. So we start five days before the sensitization, 
with giving to the mice orally these uh, three short chain fatty acid, and then we sensitize the mice with ovalbumin. And at, after four, week, four weeks, we challenge the mice uh, uh, by inhalation of ovalbumin. And when we performed the metacholine provocation test, we found that the mice who received the short chain fatty acid, fatty acid already before the sensitization, those mice have a bit better. Um, result uh, of this metacobaline provocation test. And also the mice, especially the mice that receive the butyrate, they have a high level of T-Rex compared to the mice who, uh, which did not receive the short chain fatty acid. And another study uh, here, they looked at the um, a food allergy mice model. And here again, also like a prevention model, they started three weeks before the sensitization with the sensitization with the peanut protein. And then after four weeks, they, they uh, challenged uh, the mice with the peanut protein. And they found that uh, the, the, the mice were fed by the, with the beauty rate, they have a lower anaphylaxis score uh, compared to the mice uh, who did not receive the short chain fatty acid. And also a uh, reduction of the total Ig with the mice that received the short chain fatty acid. And again, here they have shown that there was an increase of the T-Rex when the mice uh, were fed with the short chain fatty acid. So in summary, um, there are clear evidence that the gut microbiome is influenced by uh, environmental factors such as uh, nutrition. But uh, the short chain fatty acid and especially the beauty rate may represent an interesting link between uh, the early life nutrition, the gut microbiome, and the development of uh, allergy and food allergy. And we think that beauty rate might play an important role in the development of the immune oral tolerance, and therefore might play an important can be an important target for a strategy for allergy prevention. So thank you very much for your attention. Um. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Rodri, and um, thank you to all of you, our four panelists. Uh, I believe there have been some uh, questions asked now, and we're going to now move over to the uh, live um, uh, Q&A ses um, session. Um, I'm just opening up here the uh, questions. Uh, so. Uh, one, to, one question that um, I saw asked here by um, Dr. Um, uh, forgive me if I'm not pronouncing your name correctly, Dr. Gilia uh, Kuzdrayastava uh, asked about the role of sunscreens uh, and how to advise uh, young infants and children who are using sunscreens, especially if they have atopic eczema as those are, have quite a prevalent use. Um, uh, is there any of the panelists who would like to uh, to take that question? Uh, Dr. Braff. I could take that, thank you. Uh, I think it's important with sunscreen that the children have a little bit of sunscreen applied to um, their arm first to make sure there's no irritant reaction. But I am very uh, keen to uh, advocate for sunscreen factor 50 in all children that have eczema because of the fact that their skin is more um, uh, damaged uh, because of the all the things that we've talked about now. And also because they often are having topical steroids or um, calcineurin inhibitors applied, which uh, as we know requires a factor 50 suntan lotion. Uh, the question as to whether potentially this is also driving epicutaneous sensitization may be there. I think that um, one of the really important things that I always tell all my patients is to wash their hands before applying any cream onto their child's skin, uh, because otherwise they may be applying uh, many other things such as bacteria, but also allergens. Um, thank, uh, thank you very much. Is there anyone else who would like to comment on that? Julian, I actually typed in my response a little earlier. Um, I totally agree with Helen's comment. I think uh, you really want to be sure the sunscreen has a high SPF to protect from sunburn. Uh, some of the sunscreens are lotions and that should probably be avoided since that's alcohol based. Uh, I think there's a personal preference. So that's very nice that Helen suggested to apply to the uh, small part of the skin, be sure it's not irritating. 
uh, just going out on the limb in Denver, we use Vanny cream sunscreen, which has no irritants. I think that could vary according to country or location. You just don't want something with parabens or sensitizers uh, in the sunscreen. And uh, the Vanny cream is nice because it's moisturizing, but there could be many other products in your countries that would also be equally useful. Uh, thank you, Dr. Leon. Um, there, uh, there's another question, um, uh, and uh, this is actually um, addressed to Dr. Rodway. Is there a change in circulating butyrate levels during the day? Uh, are these uh, levels uh, dependent on type of the food intake uh, in, in the preceding hours? So we, we don't have this data. We don't have data that we uh, that we can say how how long how 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 di direct is the impact of the of the intake of food on the on the level of butyrate. Uh, this is but but most likely as as I mentioned, this production of butyrate comes from the gut microbiome, and so the the, the consumption of fiber. So most likely, this is not something that have a very direct uh, effect on the on the level of the of the butyrate but clearly this is something very important question uh, how how quickly is this um, this change on the level of butyrate uh, with the food intake thank you uh, we had here another uh, question actually um, uh, for dr Braff. has there been any research done on topical steroids and topical steroid withdrawal, uh, given your research recommends using topical steroids at such an early age. So I think this may be referring to rebound or side effects. Uh, yeah, um, there, there, there is definitely some uh, work that's been done looking at the condition called a steroid withdrawal, where the, the individual seems to have the steroids applied and then once they stop the steroids their eczema goes completely out of control um, that that is the sort of definition of it uh, it is something that if it were to happen then the child would obviously have to stop the topical steroids uh, and have to gradually come off that uh, but this is often in children that have had um, or adults that have had prolonged steroids for a long time um, thank you very much um, uh, are there, uh, Tino, Kari, are there any other questions that I'm missing here in the Q&A session or? I think there may be some questions, Gideon, for Caroline in the chat room. Um, yeah. Okay, in the chat box, I, yeah, I was looking at yes. the Q&A. Yes, uh, if people can uh, put their questions in the Q&A, that would be great. I see some of them in the chat. Yeah, I think um, Dr. Lack, can you see the chat? Oh, I'm room, opening please. the chat box. Yeah. Thank you um, so much. Um, um, but please, uh, yeah. So, so there's an interesting. The Q &A, that would be great. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, no. Dr. Lack. Yeah. If others, if any other questions, please do put them in Q and A. But uh, there's one here from Lingzia Soon, um, uh, uh, presumably um, to Dr. Rodwig. Can you eat butyrate to have the same effect, or uh, does it have to be the gut microbiota that are producing these to have an effect? Yeah, that's, that's a very important question. And it's what I tried to show you with this, uh, the, the only data we have now is the, this mice model that I've shown that we fed the, the, the mice with the short chain fatty acid. And here we could show that there is an increase also of the, of the T-Rex uh, directly, uh, the T-Rex from the lungs, uh, but also in the, in the food allergy mice model, there was also a clear an effect when the, we, we fed the mice with the butyrate. But this is clearly something uh, that we need to go, do further research to, to look at that. But we need to say maybe the beauty rate has a terrible taste. That's a that's a very difficult. Yes. Yeah. Um, well, the, no, that, that 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 is a very important point and interesting question. Um, there's one question here uh, actually, which I, I suppose all the panelists could uh, take. It's got several parts to it. Um, which emollient do you prescribe to an atopic newborn with atopic <laughs> siblings? Uh, 
and how often should they use it? And then I'm intrigued by this question, the old question about how often to bathe. What about baths? Frequency, um, oil bath, oily bath, bath soap, etc. Uh, but you know, uh, just the frequency of bathing alone is a controversial issue. Um, so um, um, perhaps um, uh, any of the panelists, Dr. Uh, Leong, Dr. Braff, um, uh, um, Dr. Braff, I see you have your arm up, your hand up. So please, and then we can uh, hear from Dr. Answer first. He's already <laughs> smiling. <laughs> um, and then we'll hear your comments after, Donald. Uh, okay. Please, Helen. I think this is, um, it'll be interesting to see people's uh, opinions because lots of people uh, have told been told different things. So my approach is that before the child has eczema, you bathe less. So no eczema, no dry skin. You assume that that child has a normal skin barrier. They have a normal skin microbiome and they don't have dysfunctional skin. So the aim is not to bathe too frequently in babies that are um, young infants that have um, no signs of dry skin or eczema, so twice a week. And I know there was some data in the EAT study which looked at frequency of bathing and showed that increased frequency of bathing was associated with, with the development of eczema. Once they have eczema, uh, I always think of eczema like a wound, which you need to clean to, um, to restore the skin barrier. So daily bathing is what I recommend. To answer the question uh, stated here about what I would prescribe to an atopic newborn with atopic siblings, if they have no eczema or dry skin, I will not be recommending any topical uh, moisturizing cream to that uh, child, given the findings that we've had um, in the Cochrane review that I presented. Uh, with regards to baths, um, I, I've, I've discussed that. Oil in the bath, I don't recommend. Bath soap, um, I don't recommend, but I would recommend a non-soap-based cream wash, um, which could be used instead. Thank you. Um, Dr. Leung. You know, I totally agree with Hel Helen on these points. The only thing I would emphasize, which I don't think she mentioned, is that the person who asked the question wanted to know about wetting the skin without putting a moisturizer on. And that is, is definitely a no-no. I think that if you just wet the skin and let it dry on the skin, it's gonna create dryness and chapping of the skin. So at National Jewish, as you know, Gideon, from your training, we, we preached soak and seal. So I think that's something that we usually do. And I think you, you know, what we're moving towards with skin tape and these transepidermal water loss instruments that are coming out is that for somebody with normal skin, you just carry on. But if you have severe eczema and it is multiple etiologies, multiple endotypes and later phenotypes, one would really prefer to be able to more precisely measure what is the, the root of the skin barrier dysfunction. And then with precision medicine, eventually get to the point where one can have a regimen in a clinic that would tell them what to do. But we're not there at, at all close, but we're moving and inching towards it. Um, thank you. I don't know if there's, um time for one or two more questions. Um, Dr. Nadeau, or are we I reaching- I think so. Really we, the uh, we were going to have a break, but um, if people are okay, let's answer those questions and then we'll go on. But it was a question for you, Carrie. Dr. Kabashima. Carrie, somebody answer question, ask a question that I thought you could answer, which is whether or not do pixins being used for treatment of food allergy? <laughs> without combination of OIT. Yeah. Do you want to take Thank that you. question? Sure, I can try if the panelists are okay with that. Thank you. Yes, uh, Regeneron, the company that makes Dupixent, which is an anti-IL-4 receptor alpha blockade agent, it's a monoclonal antibody, uses an injection. And uh, because it was effective in asthma and also in some other diseases, um, and because it affects the allergic pathways high in some of the immune pathways, it prevents potentially allergic disorders. And so because of that, and because we have heard from our panelists and our speakers 
that um, atopic dermatitis as well as food allergies are linked in many children, that there is a study going on that if people are interested, they can look up on clinicaltrials.gov and they, are, they, Regeneron, is using it in infants now to be able to see if it can help out uh, with potentially preventing other allergic disorders. So yes, there is a trial right now and we don't have the results yet, but importantly is that the regulatory agencies have allowed it to be used in younger populations. So I'm excited that it could potentially be useful. And as you've heard from a lot of people today, there are other non-injectable items that potentially could be used to prevent as well. So we're trying to focus on that today. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Dr. Nadeau. Uh, one more question here. Mechanistically, how would IL-9 fit in AD pathogenesis while protective against melanoma? Uh, so again, uh, perhaps um, uh, any of the panelists, but um, Dr. Leong, Dr. Nadeau. Uh, you want to take it, Carrie? I mean, presumably IL-9, but, but you may have different data. IL-9 works on mast cells, so presumably since mast cells play a key role in anaphylaxis, it may be uh, increasing the number of mast cells or its sensitivity to the allergen. Obviously, in a different disease like melanoma, mast cells may even be protective as it is part of the immune system. That's right. Um, Dr. Broff really published an excellent paper on IL-9 and its association with high degrees of severe allergies. I'll ask Dr. Broff if she's interested in answering that question. Um, thank you very much. We showed that IL-9 um, was a, a predominant um, interleukin that was found in children with peanut allergy uh, when we used PCR analysis. And we hypothesize that it's due to a proliferation of, of mast cells uh, and that there may be some interaction between the skin and gut. But Nick et al. looked at the itch scratch sort of cycle where itching of the skin then leads to um, uh, mast cell proliferation and also increased um, migration of mast cells. And so potentially these are going to the gut and then when peanut is consumed in the gut, this could then lead to um, allergic responses. Thank you, Dr. Brock. So Dr. Lack, I think we'll end this session now if that's okay with you and then we'll go to the session moderated by Dr. Bird. Thank uh, you absolutely. so much. Thank you all for an excellent session and uh, thank you to the participants for, uh, for excellent questions and we'll be joining later. Bye-bye. Thank you, everyone. Okay, thank you. I'll hand it over to Dr. Bird, who'll be moderating the next session called Pathways to Prevention Methods of Food Allergy. Thank you so much. And then we'll have uh, a break at around uh, 9.50 a.m. Uh, Pacific Daylight Time, if we can. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Dr. Nadeau. So diving right into session two, we'll start with our very first speaker, Dr. Kabashima, who is from the Allergy Center at the National Center for Child Health and Development in Tokyo, Japan. Dr. Kabashima. Thank you very much for your kind introduction. Please let me show my slides. Okay, hello everyone. My name is Shigenori Kabashima. I'm a pediatrician and allergist working for uh, National Center for Health and Development. Now you are seeing our a picture of our institution and uh, located in Tokyo, Japan. Now it's my pleasure and honor to have this opportunity to talk about my topic, prevention of egg allergy I declare no conflict of interest uh, in relation to this presentation. In 2017, we published a paper on a clinical trial named Quickie Study, which investigated ways to prevent egg allergy. 
Today, I would like to talk about how we design this study and how it has changed the way we start feeding eggs to infants in Japan. Children all over the world are affected by egg allergy in varying degrees, especially in their early life. When we look at data in Western countries, egg is among the common allergenic foods, but not the most common one. In East Asia countries, such as China, Korea, and Japan, the situation is a, a bit different. Egg is reported to be the most common allergenic food. The figure on the left shows data from a birth cohort study in Japan. As you see, egg is at the top. Though 70% of infantile egg allergy cases go into remission by seven years old, as you see in the right figure. The quality of life of the patient is impaired in the meantime. Also, some patients do not develop immune tolerance until they are older than school age. So egg allergies place a heavy burden on patients and their families. Therefore, we wanted to investigate a way to prevent egg allergy. Going back to 2012, when we designed the study, we were excited at the idea of dual exposure hypothesis, which suggested strategies to prevent food allergies. We designed our study based on this idea that early consumption of food might prevent food allergies. Our basic strategy to prevent egg allergy was to introduce eggs in weaning diets as early as six months of age. One key point was efficiency. We decided to target a high-risk population, namely infants with eczema, in order to effectively reduce egg allergy in the society. Another point was adaptability to the real world. We wanted to make sure that the prevention method we develop would be something regular people can practice in their daily lives. Because we targeted high-risk population, we had to assume that they are potentially allergic to food proteins and the first bite may trigger an allergic reaction. So we needed to take steps to ensure their safety. In well-known leap study, they carefully excluded high-risk infants by carrying out skin prep tests in the inclusion process. As a, as a result, they observed no severe symptoms. We wanted to take a different approach, one that did not involve, involve medical screening, screening like skin prep tests we decided to start in introducing eggs in a small enough amount that would not cause allergenic, allerg allergic, allergic reactions. So what is a small enough amount? We looked at the various papers that studied the threshold of tri triggering a reaction in patients with egg allergy, but we couldn't find any helpful information for our study. Fortunately, another study we conducted before the PUTI study gave us a clue. We had carried out a clinical study named SMILE study, which was a randomized trial to confirm the effectiveness of small dose oral immunotherapy. Patients with egg allergy were treated with 40 milligram of cooked whole egg powder or placebo powder for six months. After the intervention, the treatment effects were assessed. The results showed that symptom induction threshold tended to increase in the egg powder group. However, the difference was not significant. Notably, there was no difference in the incidence of adverse reactions between the two groups and no severe reaction was observed. Thus, we we got suggestion from the SMILE study. 40 milligram of egg powder may be safe for population with potential egg allergies. At the same time, 40 milligram of egg powder may not be effective enough to induce sufficient immune tolerance. 
Based on these ideas, we designed a clinical trial in two steps. At six months old, partic participants were introduced with 50 milligrams of cooked egg powder. The amount of egg powder is a little more than 40 milligrams because of producing problem of the powder packages, but we didn't think it would make much difference. After three months, the amount of egg powder was increased to ensure the effect of preventing egg allergy. How much egg powder should be provided at this, at this point was a difficult question. Because we didn't find any data to help us, we picked up the egg powder amount based on a simple guess. The idea was that as, hum, as we human ingest many kinds of foods and establish immune tolerance in our infancy, the amount an infant could easily eat was the amount that could induce immune, immune tolerance because otherwise we wouldn't be able to acquire immune tolerance to a wide variety of foods. These are the test powders we produced. We actually fed the test powders to some infants and identified 250 milligram was the amount they could comfortably eat in a few bites. Thus, the participants were asked to consume 50 milligram of test powder daily for the first three months and 250 milligram for the next three months. Each powder is equivalent to 0.2 gram and 1.1 gram of cooked whole egg, respectively. During the intervention period, we attentively treated eczema because we wanted to make the problem simple. Eczema of varying severity among participants may mask the effect of the intervention. After the completion of the intervention, the participants underwent an oral food challenge with egg powder equivalent to 32 grams of cooked whole egg. The result was clear. In terms of effectiveness, early introduction significantly reduced the incidence of egg allergy. From a safety point of view, ingestion of the test powder did not cause any obvious allergic symptoms. This study found that the oh, sorry. This study found that the stepwise egg introduction was a safe and effective way to prevent egg allergy. In response to the result of the PUTI study, the Japanese Society of Pediatric, Pediatric Allergy made recommendations on how to introduce egg into winning foods. Infants without eczema are advised to start feeding eggs following the guideline published by the Japanese government. Infants with eczema are advised to have the eczema properly treated first when eczema is successfully treated, introduction of small amount of egg is recommended. If eczema does not improve, referral to an allergist is recommended. Also, the PUTI study has changed the lactation and weaning support guide published by the Japanese government. In 2019, the guideline has been revised so that the recommended time of, in, of egg introduction is moved up, moved up from seven, eight months to five, six months. Many Japanese parents are advised to wean their children according to this guideline. So they are becoming more and more aware of the benefit of early introduction. At the end of my talk, I would like to briefly describe our recent research named PATCH study. We are investigating whether aggressive treatment of eczema, eczema reduces the onset of egg allergy in the first six months of life. After the trial, most of the participants are followed up through six years old in a cohort study named the PATCH study. We have already completed the primary endpoint evaluation oral food challenges for all the participants, and we are in the process of data cleaning. We would like to share the result with you in the near future.
those. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much for that talk, Dr. Kabashima. Excellent. Uh, our next speaker is Dr. Pawankar from the Nippon Medical School in Tokyo, Japan. Dr. Pawankar. Dr. Pawankar, are you able to? Here you are. You're muted. Okay, can you hear me? I can, thank you. Okay, uh, thank you very much for the kind introduction. And I'm Ruby Pavankar from Nippon Medical School, Tokyo, Japan. And I'd like to thank Carrie and the team for this kind invitation to, to be able to talk in this very important symposium. It's not just an opportunity to speak, but there's so much to learn from the talks of everyone else. So I'm really, really grateful for this opportunity. Um, what I'm going to talk about is uh, more about the primary prevention of allergies of probiotics and prebiotics. Now, this is an area which is still evolving. There is uh, a lack of data to some extent, and there is also some information. So I would like to just uh, present what we have now through the different guidelines. Uh, this was a global survey that was conducted way back um, in 2012. Uh, led by Dr. Susan. Bonker, could you could you please share your slides again? I'm not seeing them. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Just a second. Oh no. Okay. Can you see the That's slides? That's it. Yes, ma'am. That's it. Perfect. Okay. So let me just go on to the full screen. Sorry. That's great. <laughs> Thank you. So I just need to, yeah. Okay. Uh, this is a study that uh, was a survey that was done in 2012, led by Susan Prescott. Uh, when I was president of the World Allergy Organization, basically the idea was to look at what was the prevalence of food allergy globally. Um, it's not a study that was a research-based study, but more like a survey to all our member societies. And we looked at the prevalence of food allergy throughout the world. As you can see in this uh, uh, figure uh, graph, that the, there's three different uh, criteria of diagnosing. One is, of course, the most uh, highest level of evidence through oral food challenge. The other is symptoms and sensitization. And the lowest level of evidence is, of course, parent reporting. What this actually showed is that most of the studies were based on, or most of the data that came through the survey was through parent reporting. Some were from symptoms and sensitization, and some through oral food uh, challenge. But the interesting part was all the studies had shown an increase in the prevalence of food allergy over the years. When you look at this data, actually, which is through the oral food challenge in children less than five years of age, you can see again very clearly that across the different countries in the different continents that there is actually an increase in the uh, prevalence of uh, food allergy in children less than five years. So while respiratory allergies were increasing over the years in several years, in recent years, the incidence of food allergy and eczema uh, have been increasing as, as a second wave in the increase of atopic diseases. We have heard from several of the speakers in the, in the first session also the role of different aspects that actually influence uh, the development of allergies. Uh, when you look at the different factors, they include environmental factors as well as lifestyle risk factors. It's the so. So you have genetic factors that actually would uh, contribute to the development of allergic diseases. Uh, there are pollutants that actually further aggravate uh, the um, progression of allergic diseases. Then there is the uh, reduced biodiversity, which again contributes not just to allergic diseases, but to a variety of non-communicable diseases. And of course, this includes urbanization, industrialization also, and the Western diet, as well as a reduction in the level of vitamin D. Uh, then there, of course, we've talked, we've heard about the microbiome and the microbes. 
the diversity, so a, re a reduced diversity in the microbial composition. And this being influenced by a variety of factors like the C-section, antibiotics, and dietary factors that I will come to in the slides ahead. Now, what are the influences on the microbiome in early life? And this is looking at the data of C-section significantly altering the abundance of the bacterial taxa over time, especially in the first year of life. So as you can see here very clearly in the first year of life, that the, the those uh, children that were born uh, with a C-section had uh, altered or re reduced abundance of the bacterial taxa in the first year of life, again, uh, influencing the microbiome in early life. Now we don't know here, and it's an open-ended question here, and I think is an area of much interest to see how actually the maternal diet would actually influence the microbiome in early life. Uh, the other important issue is antibiotics and the use of uh, antibiotics in early life and the microbiome maturation. Here again, it shows very clearly that the early antibiotic exposure leads to significant delay in the microbiota maturation during the first six to 12 months of life, as you can see here in this, those that are exposed and those that are unexposed. And these are also all seen in animal experiments, also showing that mice actually uh, treat, treated with antibiotics actually have uh, lowered microbial maturation. What are the other postnasal risk factors for the development of allergy and asthma? Well, you have early viral infections, you have urbanization, industrialization, and westernized lifestyle, as I already mentioned, antibiotic use, again, as I already mentioned, the family size is uh, one of the factors that may contribute to it, absence of older siblings, a Western diet, a high fat consumption, uh, passive smoking, obesity, uh, delayed introduction of foods, uh, leading to delayed oral, oral tolerance, uh, more indoor activity and less exercise or less out, time outdoors, low levels of vitamin D, and uh, plus, of course, the low dose cutaneous allergen exposure. So all these factors can actually lead to allergic sensitization and a type two inflammation. When we talk about allergy prevention, there are three types. There's primary prevention, there's secondary prevention, and tertiary prevention. What we practice in medicine today is tertiary prevention because we're treating the disease after the disease actually exists. What is being done through different forms like immunotherapy or maybe even uh, biologics if used early in life is secondary prevention, again, uh, and what is primary prevention is what we are all aiming at. And how do we achieve this? Is it uh, in a healthy high-risk child? How do we actually achieve primary prevention? So this actually is very well known. I don't want to uh, talk much about it because it's been covered already by several of the speakers before, but just trying to highlight that the early introduction of food over here, as you can see here, in the AIDS study that the early introduction has clearly shown that the incidence of allergy development in these children are much less as compared to those that were uh, given the conventional uh, standard way of introducing food. So what about probiotics and prebiotics? So probiotics do influence the gut microbiota. They are live organisms, which when administered in adequate amounts can confer a health benefit on the host. And prebiotics are a substrate that is selectively utilized by the host microorganisms conferring a health benefit. Now, when you look at this data, this is the use of probiotic. Actually, there is a reduction in the incidence of atopic dermatitis by 50% with the use of lactobacillus GG. So the World Allergy Organization during my presidency in 2012 and led by Alexandro Fiocchi we actually started uh, to look at uh, the evidence for prevention. What was there in the literature that uh, actually could give us a direction? So we looked at probiotics, prebiotics, vitamin D, and also in line were, uh, is the plan to look at short chain fatty acids and hydrolyzed formulas, which have not yet been done. But I'd like to highlight about the uh, recommendations from this on uh, probiotics and prebiotics. 
And this uh, was done through the grade approach, which is of course the highest level of evidence. So as you can see here in this slide, very clearly that while the different allergic diseases were looked at, eczema, asthma, food allergy, uh, all these were looked at, and it was only eczema that actually had an effect. So there were nine fewer per 100 uh, cases of atopic eczema with the use of probiotics. So again, uh, probiotics in breastfeeding and eczema, again, favors the use of probiotics. Probiotics in infancy and eczema, again, favors the use of probiotics. And again, uh, the next point is the pooling of data. When there are so many studies which actually are done with different methodologies and different strains, so are they all equal? This is an important question to answer. This could actually result in uh, understanding whether this conclusion is uh, correct or is it too premature. So on the basis of the currently available data from experimental studies, what we understand is that there are various strains that have been looked at and the methodologies by which they are studied are also different. So how do we actually analyze this? Which probiotic, if any, should be used and what is the effective dose? When should the probiotic be given and when should it be stopped? And is there a class effect? These are questions that need to be answered. The only a probiotic that has been studied in more than one st randomized control study is Lactobacillus rhamnosus GG, as you can see over here in this uh, uh, slide here. Again, LGG in infancy and eczema shows favoring uh, for Lactobacillus GG in infancy and eczema. And when you look at, let me go back, indicating very clearly that uh, while probiotics could be considered as a, a potential a recommendation for use in uh, children at high risk of eczema or in infancy and eczema, it is again based on the strain and there is only evidence for one particular strain and that is Lactobacillus GG. What about probiotics? Again, for, pro, uh, for prebiotics, prebiotics in infancy and eczema, again, show a positive result, uh, favoring, uh, of course, the use of prebiotics, again, in asthma and wheezing, and again, of course, in food allergy. But what do the different guidelines tell us? This is the most recent YACI guideline uh, looking at food allergy in infants and the prevention of food allergy in infants and young children. And there is no recommendation for or against for preventing food allergy uh, for the use of probiotics or prebiotics. When you look at the ASCIA guidelines, again, in the ASCIA gu guidelines, there is no recommendation for probiotic supplementation. And uh, here also do not use prebiotics. So neither probiotics nor prebiotics are recommended in the ASCIA guidelines. So what exactly was the recommendation that was actually composed in Asia Pacific uh, region, uh, com combining all the different guidelines and looking at the situation in this region, is the use of probiotic and prebiotics during pregnancy and early infancy are recommended in the WOW GLAD P guidelines, in the Singapore guidelines, and in the Hong Kong guidelines, but not recommended in the ASCIA guidelines. So, although still a matter of intense debate, taking bacterial products, probiotics, prebiotics, or symbiotics during the last trimester of pregnancy, mainly lactobacillus species, including Lactobacillus rhamnosus GG or L. ruteri, has been shown to reduce the risk of uh, allergic disease, mainly of eczema in children, although negative studies have also been reported. It is noted, however, that long-term outcomes may have disappointing results. So the important thing now is actually that there's an open-ended question is we need to have more robust studies looking at the different strains as studied under the cir same circumstances and large studies in order to understand the role of probiotics and prebiotics or symbiotics in the prevention of uh, food allergy or in the prevention of allergies in general. So I'd like to conclude by saying that in order to recommend probiotics for allergy prevention, 
it needs to be proven that a specific probiotic bacterium or a mixture of probiotic strains given to the pregnant or breastfeeding mother or directly to the infant that's at high risk or a young child reduces the risk of later allergies. Although systematic reviews and meta-analysis in this field are very frequent and sometimes outnumber the number of original studies, they're often not helpful because uh, they're misleading because they sometimes pool studies using different strains. And so one has to really look at strain specific evidence. And so there is currently no clear positive recommendation uh, from scientific societies to use prebiotics or probiotics. And finally, I'd like to invite you to Apache 2021 uh, conference, which is fully virtual uh, in less than a month, October 15 to 17, which will have many topics covered in this space. Thank you very much. Fantastic, excellent talk. Thank you, Dr. Kwanker. Our final speaker for this morning's uh, session number two is Dr. Gupta from the Northwestern University Feinberg School of Medicine in Chicago, uh, United States. Dr. Gupta. Thank you. All right, Andrew, hold on one. Okay, can you hear me now? I hear you just fine. I don't see your slides, but I can hear you well. Okay, excellent. That's one step, and let's get these slides going. We'll get the next step done. Um, my apologies, I know. Give everyone just a mini break. Here we <laughs> go. All right, share the screen. Here we go. And now, it's perfect. on? All right, all right, here we go. Well, um, first, thank you, uh, Kari and um, Stanford for hosting this great meeting. I have learned so much already and all the amazing speakers you've uh, pulled together. I'm very honored to be one of them. Uh, so today I'm gonna talk to you about current prevention and practices of caregivers and pediatricians and future directions. And this is all around uh, the prevention guidelines. These are my disclosures. Okay, we're gonna get into a little bit on prevalence. I'm, you know, I appreciate Ruby talked about uh, global. Um, I'm just gonna really jump into US. Uh, what we have seen in the US is an increase too in food allergies, one in 10 adults, about one in 13 kids. Focusing on kids, focusing on prevention. We know about those 8% of kids um, have a number of food allergies. And here is uh, the top nine in the United States. So it's peanut, then milk, shellfish, tree nut, egg, thin fish, wheat, soy, and sesame. This is our most recent study that was published in 2018. Um, when we look at age groups, we see here, you know, milk is definitely the highest in those younger kids, uh, pretty much accounts for half of all food allergies. Egg two is higher in those younger kids. And then of course you can see peanut, um, but you can see that a lot of kids do develop tolerance, uh, natural tolerance to milk and egg. However, you know, the tree nuts and shellfish and fish, um, that's more rare. Okay. I'm going a little fast because you all know all of this. So I want to really show you some really interesting data uh, that we've uh, pulled together. But just really quick reminder in the US, uh, the AAP guidelines in the year 2000 said to avoid peanuts until three years of age. Those uh, changed in 2008, but people continued, um, especially pediatricians, to say that because we didn't have any good studies. Um, thanks to the LEAP study, we changed our guidelines in the US. Our guidelines are different than international guidelines, um, a little bit more complex. So we evaluate high risk and then moderate to low risk. Um, so high risk infants uh, with severe eczema, egg allergy, or both uh, need to get um, an IgE either by their pediatrician, and I'll get into this a little bit more, or refer to an allergist prior to introducing peanuts. Um, and then of course, moderate to low risk, we encourage peanut introduction. So this is, you know, obviously a small group, but it is uh, the most important group, these severe eczematous or egg allergy kids or infants. So let's talk about adherence. So in adherence, you know, we, we talk about this a lot because all of us, you know, publish papers and how do we then get it to the people? This whole translation is the most complex part, right? Now we know prevention works, is it happening? Are we able to get it to pediatricians, to get it to families, to adopt it and make it happen? So there's four steps to this, awareness. So first they have to be aware. 
that they exist and that there's been a change. Then there has to be agreement. Um, they believe it. And then adoption and finally adherence. So where are we? Uh, so the role of the pediatrician, you know, this is really important because as we are recommending this at this early age, four and six months, it's really up to the pediatrician to uh, recommend it and to identify uh, and do a risk assessment. This is what we're asking pediatricians to do. So at four and six month well child visits where, you know, these infants are coming in uh, and have pediatricians have about, you know, maybe 10 minutes with them to talk about everything, right? So from, you know, how are they developing? How are they sleeping? Any um, illnesses or issues, immunizations? I mean, there's a ton of things that go on at those visits. So how do we encourage them to also encourage early peanut introduction? They have to assess them to see if they're high risk or if they're moderate to low risk. If they are high risk, they have to make a determination if they wanna get a peanut IgE. Uh, then if that peanut IgE comes back negative, they have to call the patient and tell them to start peanut products. If it's positive, they need to refer them to an allergist. And then the patient has to get to an allergist. And then the allergist uh, recommendations are these. So the allergist would do a skin prick test. Depending on uh, the results of that, they would do a uh, oral food challenge or in an in office supervised feeding, if it's three to seven millimeters greater than eight, they're encouraged to say they're likely allergic and should not be eating peanuts. All right, so now this is, this is the data I wanted to show you. So this uh, has been put into effect, but what is actually happening? So these are uh, two papers um, we published uh, around pediatricians adherence and allergist adherence of the guidelines in the United States. And you can see here, uh, we asked, are you using the guidelines as published and rarely deviate from any part? And only you know, less than 30% of pediatricians said yes. Uh, two thirds of allergists said yes. And then it was kind of reversed if you can see using only parts of the guidelines, two thirds of pediatricians said yes, and one third of allergists said yes. So the objective of the pediatrician survey was to really understand their awareness, as we talked about, and their implementation, any barriers and concerns in need so that we could actually um, help support them better. And uh, this was published in 2020. Now, it was a survey. We ended up using the AAP database, a vendor that works with the AAP, so the American Academy of Pediatrics and surveyed a total of uh, 1,800 um, providers. The response rate was not great as it usually isn't when you send mass surveys to pediatricians since they get asked about everything. Um, so here is what they told us. Main barriers were parental concerns. So the parents were concerned about allergic reactions. If they were to introduce early, they were concerned about blood draws and they were just not interested. And then the other big concern was their own familiarity with the guidelines. So 33% um, said that was an issue and the newness of the guidelines. A lot of pediatricians wanted to wait and see since there was such a drastic change in the guidelines. The other barriers they mentioned was conducting an in-office supervised feed, which was in the guidelines. Um, so we know that pediatricians don't do that and they should not do that. Um, the other one is lack of clinic time. So back to that four and six month, very, very busy visits. How do we support pediatricians to be able to, um, and all pediatric providers, actually, I shouldn't just say pediatricians, but all providers to be able to fit it in and be able to give them uh, good information. And then you can see the rest. A little bit of concern about conducting in peanut specific IgE, allergic reactions, et cetera. Okay. This was really important because we asked them if they needed more training on the guidelines and two thirds said yes. So this is very important information. They are admitting that they don't really know it and they would like more information. So um, this is an area that we are addressing. Uh, and then what did they want? So a printed script to explain it, a printed handout. Um, so just tools for them to better help their patients. Um, and then so the main takeaways, they want more training, 
their parental concerns that they have to deal with, their own understanding of the guidelines, and then some of those pieces like conducting an in-office challenge or, or lack of time. All right, I'm gonna get into the allergists just briefly because um, there are some key important things. So we also uh, worked with the NIAID to survey allergists and see how they were doing with the guidelines and similar things, awareness, implementation, how they're getting their information, the services they provide, barriers, and their need for training. So again, um, we did this through the Quad AI, partnered with the Quad AI, uh, and um, we did get a better response rate with the allergists with a total final of 825 eligible respondents. So most allergists are very aware, which is great. Um, 97%. Uh, and then this was the implementation I've already shown you, uh, two thirds fully implementing and one third partially implementing. And then this is indicate your level of agreement with the guidelines. So the majority agreed, um, just a small proportion, neither agreed or disagreed. Okay, what do allergists say they do? So they're all doing it, um, advising parents on peanut allergy prevention, doing the SPTs, the IGEs, just a little bit less doing the oral food challenges, but still 87, 88%, and supervised feeds, 85%. How are they getting these patients? So they said referrals uh, by pediatricians was the first one, then parent self-referrals. So they're actually coming in on their own, family medicine, derm, other allergists, and then internists. Okay, of patients referred for early intro, how often is peanut specific IG provided? So, you know, we, in the guidelines to make it a little bit more streamlined, uh, pediatricians can order a specific IgE. We were hoping this would cut out half of, hopefully, you know, the infants that need to go see an allergist and have them introduce earlier. Um, but, you know, and they're learning it, but I'll show you what the pediatricians say about this too. But um, some of the time was 74%, none of the time was 20%. Um, okay, this is what uh, allergists told us were barriers. So parental concerns, again, same as what pediatricians said. They were concerned about allergic reactions or just not interested or didn't want blood draws. And then other things, the biggest uh, barrier was lack of referrals. So a third of them said they're just not getting referrals. Um, and then again, these we talked about concern for allergic reactions, lack of clinic time, similar things uh, that we heard from the pediatricians. And then these are the most common deviations allergists told us from the guidelines. So uh, I consider, consider additional factors outside of just eczema or egg allergy, things like family history. I conduct an SBT in children without severe eczema or egg allergy. I conduct an OFC when the guidelines recommend home introduction or an in-office feeding. I conduct an IgE in children without severe eczema. Um, I use different peanut wheel size thresholds than what the guidelines recommend. Did allergists want more training? Well, 45% said yes, 46%. So again, you know, training, 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 um, really important to increase uh, acceptance and adoption and then adherence. So just a summary, uh, most of them are using either the full or partial guidelines. We talked about some of the deviations, major issues are parental concerns, uh, and then they were deviating for specific reasons that we went over. Okay, all right, I wanna get to this. I know I'm running out of time, but this is very important. Um, we just conducted a caregiver survey. So what are caregivers doing in, um, in the US around peanut allergy or peanut introduction. Um, so this was just conducted earlier this year, January to February. This is hot off the press, it's not published yet. We uh, talked to caregivers of um, children aged seven months to three and a half years. Uh, we had 3,000, approximately 3,000 uh, caregivers respond. This is demographics, this was a national survey. Um, as you can see, I'm not gonna go through this, but it was relatively diverse um, and we did have, you know, diversity in education and annual household income. So these were not all highly educated uh, caregivers. So here you see, so how many in the beginning of 2021 
for introducing peanut products before one year of age in the US, the total number is 44.7%. So less than half are introducing peanut products to their infants in the first year of life. And this is just broken down. So 44.7 by 12 months is the total. You can see, you know, 28.9% said by nine months and very few by six months. How much are you feeding during that first month of feeding? And you can see, you know, the recommendations are two teaspoons, um, but not many were doing that or more. The majority uh, were doing less. One teaspoon was the most common, but even half a teaspoon or less than half a teaspoon. Frequency of feeding during that first month. So were they doing it, you know, two to three times a week? No, um, the majority were just doing it a few times a month. Um, you can see the breakdown once weekly, a few times a week uh, was only 25% or one in four. Uh, just wanna show you some other data. This is, we asked also about when did you introduce other foods? So, you know, we talked about peanut, you can see egg does seem to be introduced earlier, uh, cow's milk as well. But when you get into the other nuts, really not much, you know, almond, um, not yet is the most common answer for most of these. And 13 to 24 months um, was the second most common. Now you look at cashew, same, not yet. Walnut, not yet. Sesame, a little bit more earlier, but not much. And then um, soy did have more in those early years, but again, mostly after uh, one year of age. Okay. Um, Quickly, I just want to also mention for the caregivers, how, you know, have you even heard about the recommendations? Are we getting this information to caregivers? Um, and you can see here, no, we're not in the U.S. Even though we do so many campaigns um, through so many uh, organizations, food allergy advocacy groups and the NIAID and all of us, you know, to our patients, 70% said no, uh, they did not know about these new recommendations. And we broke this down. So the purple is all participants. The green is eczema, who we hope they know about it. And then um, the orange is moderate to severe eczema uh, or egg allergy with onset by 12 months. And so you can see they're all about equal. Now, do you think that feeding peanut containing foods in the first year of life decreases your child's risk of developing a peanut allergy? The majority did not know. There was a small proportion that said yes or yes, somewhat, yes, minimally. Um, and then, you know, 20% said no, not at all. At what age do you think it's safe to start feeding peanut containing foods to your child? And you can see this is also all over the place, right? A um, lot of people did say younger, so that's a good thing. At least they do feel like it is safe uh, earlier in that first year of life. Do you think that feeding other foods will decrease, other allergenic foods will decrease the risk of your child developing a food allergy to these foods? And again, you can see yes, yes, somewhat, yes, minimally. But, you know, a third said, you know, I just don't know. Okay, finally, uh, I want to show you this because I think, you know, when you see the allergist survey saying we're not getting referrals, and then you see the pediatricians that they're, you know, doing partial uh, recommendations. Here you see what the caregivers are telling us. Did your child's PCP refer you to an allergist before introducing peanut containing foods in the diet? And these are only kids uh, who had eczema, only infants who had eczema. So 88% said no, and 11% said yes. So we need to do a better job of this. Then of the 11% that said yes, I was referred, we said, did your child see an allergist? And 87% said no. So now you're seeing how few of them are actually getting the appointment or going. And when we asked them, well, why didn't you go to an allergist? This is what they said, no appointments, did not know how to make it, could not afford it. And then I did not think the appointment was necessary. So a uh, lot of work we have to do in um, education. And then just finally, I just wanna talk about these two quick studies. Uh, we are working um, with the NIAID through this U01 uh, on a study called iReach, where we are um, trying to do that education for pediatricians through a clinical decision support tool in their EMR. So we have uh, 30 clinics, almost, I think, uh, 400 clinicians, 
and half of them are getting the intervention and half of them are not. And, uh, and what we're hoping to see is improved pediatric uh, recommendations. And then we are following up with the caregivers to see if they actually did introduce peanut products um, to their infants. And then we're gonna follow them to see if we can reduce the incidence of peanut allergy in the US. This is a very exciting, um, we already have 6,000 infants uh, enrolled and, and we're pulling their data and uh, it'll, be, it'll be nice to see because if this does end up working well, um, we have tools developed that we can uh, push out to pediatricians across the country and world. And then the SEED study, this is another very exciting study. I think uh, I'm working with a lot of people on this that are on this call um, or in this symposium. Um, so we are um, going to uh, follow up from EAT in the U.S. and we are introducing multi-foods to infants early. And these are the foods, milk, egg, cashew, walnut, almond, soy, and sesame. Um, these will start at four months. The study will enroll about 2,000 infants from diverse pediatric practices. In Chicago, we're partnering with U of C and Rush on this. And then of course, you know, Colorado for our expert in um, food introduction. And of course, uh, Gideon and Helen and all their teams um, to help advise us on how to do this appropriately. But we're very excited about this. We're getting ready to kick off in October uh, and um, looking forward to getting this data from the US. And then our goal is to get it done before the 2025 USDA dietary guidelines come out uh, so that we can provide uh, recommendations from introduction of allergenic foods in the United States. And that's it. Um, this is all our information. I did want to show you, we do have quite a few resources. I don't have time to go through it, but I'm happy to share it. This is uh, the pediatrician handout um, that automatically gets printed for all four and six month visits. And um, you can see it starts with how do you introduce solid foods to your baby? And then the back is adding peanut protein to your baby's diet. And a lot of this was taken from the NIAID, but then we did simplify the language to make it uh, more health literate. Um, and then we have a couple other resources, but I won't go into them. I'll stop right there. Thank, Thank you very you. much, Dr. Gupta. I appreciate it. That was excellent. Thank you so much. Dr. Nadeau, um, we are right at time for a break. Do you, would you like for us to ask just a few questions or would you like those questions to be answered offline to give the listeners a time to uh, have a short break? Yeah, thank you so much. Um, I know that uh, the Q&A uh, has some questions already. Um, if you can look at that, Dr. Bird, and see if there's anything that uh, should be responded to, we'll take two questions now. Perfect. And then um, at 10 a.m., come back so that people can have a break. Um, that sounds we'll perfect. We'll right away at 10 a.m. Pacific. Yeah, time. absolutely. Let's start with a question for Dr. Kabashima. Uh, there... There are two questions that come to mind. First, there is a question about whether or not there's any data that would suggest um, egg consumption should be encouraged for vegan infants, um, whether that might come to, to play. And also a broader question of whether, as you've expanded the introduction of egg early into the diets of Japanese infants, have you started to see more reactions um, in that age group at the 50 milligram or less uh, quantity of egg protein? Okay, thank you. And uh, thank you for the question. For the first question, I'm not aware of any data focusing on vegan people. Children from vegan family may have a different gut bi microbiome, but basically early food protein intake would induce immune tolerance. But on the other hand, the risk of transdermal sensitization in infants is somewhat lower in vegan families because they, you, they do not consume eggs in the house. And so vegan families have their own particular way of thinking and value. So we need to carefully consider the risk benefit with respect to, to these people. So I'm sorry, I don't have, I don't have clear answers. You know, we don't, we have, actually we have few uh, vegan people in Japan. So, yeah. So I'm sorry. <laughs> That's excellent. Now, Dr. Perwanker, I'd like to ask you, um, there's a question about uh, a test in Russia that detects several species of bacteria. Um, do you think that any special bacteria in the gut are more, more useful than others? Um, can you ask the question again? 
Yeah, so the question says, do you think if there are any special bacteria in the gut that are more useful than others? There's a very popular test in Russia that detects several species of bacteria and the amount of them. Is there, I think the question would be, is there any sort of clinical um, implication of that test? Well, uh, I don't know about this test in, in Russia, and I don't know if someone else in this panel or Carrie or yourself can answer that because I'm, I'm unaware of this test. But yes, as we heard in the first talk, I think butyrate producing are, are very important actually. So I, I, I think that's key um, uh, aspect. And in fact, I did want to ask that question uh, to the first group of panelists that, you know, whether something in the maternal diet could actually, uh, you know, enhance the butyrate production uh, producing bacteria in the, um, in, in, the, in the child or infant that could actually prevent the disease development. So that's one thing that one would like to look at. But we are also doing birth cohort studies, looking at children uh, from age zero to three years and following, up, uh, following them up also to five years. And we're trying to look at the, back, the microbiome composition and the development of the different allergies. And I think maybe we'll have some answer uh, from that. Again, there are studies on, on, on this microbiome that's happening all over the world. It's not just uh, our group, but I think there are also dietary factors. There are also genetic factors. There are also epigenetic factors. All this may play a role in, in and the methodology by which you do those studies may play a role in what results we actually get. Um, so I, I would just say that, well, one of the things is the butyrate producing bacteria. I, I don't know if Carrie or Ruchi or Shigonori have some comments uh, on this no. any or anyone from the first panel, because I think uh, I really like to ask that question about whether the maternal uh, diet would influence that. Looks like no one great else Great questions. Yeah, yeah, good question. Um, so, very good. Yeah, Carrie, you were saying? No, it's fine, what Dr. Bird. I was just gonna say, it looks like we're right at time. If you wanna give the attendees a chance for a short break before moving on to the next. If you have any additional questions, please submit them and then we will uh, have the panelists answer those um, separately outside of the, the discussion. Thank you, everyone. We'll have time for a quick break. We'll be back at in about three minutes. Thanks, everyone. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for joining from Japan. Yeah, it's, it's a pleasure, Kerry. Really excellent. Really appreciate. Thank you. Welcome back. We very much appreciate everyone being here. And for the next session, I'd like to introduce Dr. Adkis, who will be our moderator. And uh, thank you, Dr. Adkis, for joining us from Switzerland. And this session is called the Immune Pathways to Understanding Prevention. We very much appreciate the speakers. And this will be the last session. And we'll conclude it uh, with a wrap up and thanks before the end of the hour. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Kari. It's a great pleasure for me to moderate this last uh, session. And it's about immune pathways to understanding of prevention. And the, our first speaker is Dr. Omar Hone from the uh, uh, National University of Ireland. And he will talk about the diversity as a driver of tolerance. Please, Liam. Thank you very much, uh, Mubichel. And thank you, Carrie, for this very kind invitation to join you all today. Um, okay. So, what I would like to spend a few minutes on today is talking about diversity as a driver of immune tolerance. And specifically with diversity, I'm gonna talk about microbial diversity. So as you all know, we have a lot of microbes living in us and on us, at least half the cells in the human body are not human at all, they're microbial. And these cells are not silent, these microbes are not silent. They're metabolizing your body's secretions, they metabolize the food that you eat, and they generate literally thousands of different chemical compounds or metabolites many of which can be absorbed and can travel to sites distant to where that bacterium is living on you. And from an immunological perspective, it's really fascinating that we don't react aggressively to most of these bacteria or to their foreign metabolites. So there's very potent tolerance mechanisms 
that are in play that uh, prevent us from overreacting usually to these bacteria. And I guess our uh, overall scheme or, or theme of, of what we're doing is that we think when we miss some of these bacteria, or we miss some of these metabolites, you lose some of these tolerance inducing uh, mechanisms. So as I said, we have a lot of bacteria living in us and on us. Um, you know, the, when you add up all the genes associated with these bacteria, you have two or three million genes. Uh, and when you compare that to the human genome of 20 to 25,000 genes, that means genetically speaking, we're actually 99% microbial. But why do we need so many microbes? You know, why is it that uh, diversity uh, seems to be so important? And I think one of the reasons is actually we as humans, we don't have the enzymatic ability to digest a, a wide range of foods. We only have a, a very few enzymes that will digest carbohydrates. So actually, you know, in the pre-industrial world or in the pre-highly you know, processed food world, uh, having microbes that would digest your food was really, really important for us. And while our uh, genes stay the same, you can change the microbes very, very quickly to suit the type of diet that you're eating. And just in this very simple cartoon, I'll, I'll illustrate this here. So, you know, one part of the one time in the year, you could eat one type of food and the bacterium that will thrive in that food will increase in number during this time. And then as you change your food, uh, the bacterial numbers will decrease. But it'll be a different type of bacteria now will thrive and so on and so forth over a period of time. You can see different foods and different bacteria will thrive in those foods. And if you think of the hundreds of strains that are in the gut, of course, this complexity will increase very quickly. But what this means for the immune system is it actually poses a very significant challenge because with all these different bacteria, with all these different foods, you have very different antigen mixes that also contain a whole different uh, range of different danger signals. So I think what this means is that with each of these combinations of foods and microbes, we also have tolerance uh, inducing uh, metabolites. Our, our antigens. So overall, when you have a diverse food intake coupled with a diverse range of microbes, you have a very robust tolerance network that will prevent inappropriate immune activation. But what happens when you start to remove some of those foods or some of those microbes? You start to lose some of the tolerance inducing effects. And interestingly, you know, some of the recent surveys have shown that we can, that in many Western uh, populations, we've up to a 30% loss in gut microbial diversity. So with these food and microbe combinations, we've already heard earlier from Caroline about short chain fatty acids. These are generated following microbial fermentation of fibers in the gut. These are fibers that we can't digest, but your microbes do. And uh, for the short chain fatty acids, we usually talk about butyrate, propionate, and acetate. And this is really only one example because there's many examples of metabolites that are immunoregulatory produced by microbe, microbes in the gut, such as you know, tryptophan metabolism with aryl hydrocarbon receptor, uh, agonists or you know, polyamines being produced. But the short chain fatty acids are the ones I think we know most about currently. And Caroline has already talked about this study where you know, early life diet by you know, the introduction of yogurt and fruits and veg was associated with higher levels of butyrate and propionate in kids at one year. We showed in our animal models, this was important for the induction of T regulatory cells, which then was associated with a, a later life protection against atopic sensitization, asthma and food allergy. So we feel that this early introduction of um, yogurt is giving some new microbes to the gut and the fruits and veg are giving the fibers for those microbes to generate these short chain fatty acids. And I would just like to mention this study from Karina. I'm sure she'll talk more about it in the next talk. But in this great study that she's just published, you know, it's not just in infants, but actually during pregnancy, the consumption of yogurt and fruit and veg is associated with lower risk of allergy outcomes in the, in the infants. So again, perhaps the, uh, the non-digestible fibers provided by the fruit and veg and the bacteria provided by the yogurts is giving an environment where you can maximize short chain fatty acid production, uh, even during pregnancy, which is uh, protective. So Ruby already told us a little bit about the early life uh, events that are very important for acquisition of the microbiome. And I'm not gonna go through all of these, but I guess the point that I really wanted to make is that you have to get microbes from somewhere else. So you're born sterile 
uh, you acquire microbes from your mother, you acquire microbes from older siblings, you acquire microbes from your greater social network and from animals and from the environment. We would propose that the microbes you get from other humans are probably the most important from an immunoregulatory point of view, because these are probably the microbes that are most adapted to living uh, in, a, in a human and to not be pro-inflammatory and therefore would have a, an immunoregulatory activities or functions associated with them. But the importance of the environment for you know, the early life immune system has been shown by many authors, but this is a, a study uh, done by Nantlantel and Jani earlier uh, this year was published, where she was looking at atopic dermatitis and the immune signatures associated with atopic dermatitis. And she clearly showed that there was an immune signature. But what we were surprised at was actually most of the immune signatures were driven by the uh, environment in which the, the child uh, was raised. So she had kids from a rural environment or an urban environment. And I'm just showing two examples here, whereas IL-8 is highest in the rural kids compared to the urban kids, whereas IL-22 is opposite, it's highest in the urban kids. And a lot of this, these cytokine levels uh, differences in cytokine levels and environmental differences were driven by actually exposure to animals. So given that over the last year and a half, we've all experienced different levels of, of lockdowns, depending on where you are in the world, uh, we felt that maybe the infants born during a heavy lockdown period may have a delay in the acquisition of their early life microbiome. So this, uh, this is a study that's ongoing. Uh, we recruited kids with John and Horahan in Dublin uh, in March last year during uh, a very strict lockdown period in Ireland. And these kids are being followed up. We're looking at their microbiomes. And of course, we're looking at uh, not just allergy outcomes, but also a lot of other outcomes as well. And I hope soon to be able to share some uh, of the microbiome data with you from these kids. But we think this is really important because you know, the early life diversity and acquisition of these microbes is really important. And we've already shown that there's a, a decrease in the microbial diversity uh, for some time. So maybe these lockdown periods will really drive you know, some of these kids over the, the, the limit. And as with many things, these effects will not be evenly distributed through society, but really those uh, at most economic disadvantage would probably be most affected. So finally, I'd just like to say that you know, we feel that the diversity of foods coupled with a diverse uh, microbiome is really important um, for the immune system and for immune tolerance induction. And we really need to realize that the diet and the microbiome are hardwired actually into our decision-making process of the immune system. And just a few thoughts to, for you on diversity. Again, our uh, immune system is really shaped by non-human encoded factors, which include diet and microbes. Uh, this drives a metabolic resilience as well as immune tolerance. And a really a diverse community of microbes, you, you get to cover your bases. So even if some microbes are lost, there are others that can fill these, these functional needs. And I think rather than talking about individual microbes, perhaps community or network functional capacity is more important. And finally, I think the research into understanding how these molecular communication networks uh, go on is really important. And most of these uh, metabolites that we know are made by microbes, we still have no idea what effect they have on the immune system. So I think this is really important research to continue with. And finally, I'd like to thank everyone involved in the studies that I just showed you, and I'm happy to take questions at the end. Thank you very much for this excellent talk, Dr. Romohani. So the discussion will come later. It's a great pleasure for me to introduce the second speaker, Dr. Renter. She's from uh, University of Colorado, and uh, she will talk about the role of nutrition in immune modulation. Please, Dr. Renter. Good morning. So um, can you just confirm, do you see my slide share or the pre prevention? Yes, pre everything is perfect. Everything is fine, good, so I can go ahead. So I would like to thank the organizers for inviting me. I'm an allergy specialist dietitian by background, but I am also a faculty at the University of Colorado as an associate professor. And so today we'll be talking about, as I've said, the role of nutrition in immunomodulation. 
I do want you to be aware of my disclosures, although none of them are relevant to my presentation today. Um, I'd like to talk a little bit about um, definitions. Um, you know, I've worked um, closely with many of the speakers here today on defining biodiversity, diet quality. Um, and now um, I think our next um, project will be to define what immunonutrition means in terms of allergy prevention and management. We will also look at what we've known in the past about immunonutrition, where we are now at the present and what we need to do in the future. So um, the definition of immunonutrition really uh, has its roots in the management of the critically ill patient. Um, and I can remember as a young dietitian in South Africa, how excited we were when our first um, feed for critically ill patients with glutamine uh, was made available. And so then no surprise that when we look at the currently official definition of immunonutrition, it very much if, um, focus on the effect of nutrients and how it affects the immune system. Whereas I think, you know, we, we're beginning to understand what we need to look at the bigger picture. And I would like to propose that perhaps in future, we'd be defining immunonutrition as the study of the direct and indirect effects of food patterns, food quality, food diversity, food intake, then nutrients on epigenetic um, changes, the immune system, and the microbiome, because I think all of these are very much interlinked and it's not just a direct effect and indirect effect between the nutrients and the immune system anymore. So if we then look at the past and I'm not pointing any fingers to uh, previous guidelines because I'm a co-author on, on many of the guidelines I'm showing you here today, but really the only role nutrition had in guidelines focusing on allergy management and prevention was the fact that we didn't want the children to suffer from malnutrition and we didn't really look at the bigger picture. So when we now look at the more recent papers and guidelines coming out and many of the authors um, include the speakers here today, obviously with the interest in immunonutrition. And so no surprise then when we look at the latest consensus statement from North America and Canada, and the uh, latest guidelines from um, the European Academy of Allergy and Clinical Immunology, the role of nutrition and its effect on allergy prevention as an overall nutritional intake is mentioned, despite the fact that we had no data to really show for that. We did acknowledge that it plays a role. And then the North American and Canadian guideline also included information on diet diversity, which Dr. Caroline Rode beautifully um, summarized earlier this morning and Dr. O'Mahony um, already referenced, uh, made a reference to that as well. So, you know, where we are in the, in, the, in the present is that we are beginning to understand that it's not only the level of single nutrients that are important, but also their interactions and that it, their role and effect can also change depending on how, host specific factors. So um, one of the um, points we highlighted, well, actually two of the points we highlighted in uh, past uh, systematic reviews and position papers from IYAKI, again, with many um, people today here involved, is that it's difficult to look at the effect of single nutrients um, on allergy outcomes. And perhaps the, the reason we get such conflicting data is because the overall dietary intake or the underlying diet um, was not being studied. And then when we look at data, particularly on omega-3 fatty acid supplementation during pregnancy and or breastfeeding and early life, we, we again get very conflicting data, but baseline levels of uh, the pregnant woman or the children or breastfeeding mothers at the time supplementation started was never measured. Um, we're also beginning to understand that it's not just nutrient excesses or nutrient deficiencies um, that's important, but really when we look at food intake and um, both excesses and deficiencies can have a dramatic effect on the immune system, most often measured via um, the effect on the microbiome. But then, you know, it's, it's not a simple picture because it is a complicated tango that we have between overall diet, food, nutrient intake, the microbiome, epithelial barriers, metabolism, epigenetics, and the immune system. 
and it is therefore not that simple to study. So today I'm just going to highlight on a few of these issues. Um, I'm conscious of the time, so I'm not going to be able to discuss each of one of these points in detail. But on the next slide, we will look at nutrient excesses and um, deficiencies, perhaps more so focus on, um, on, first of all, calorie restriction. So if we just forget for a minute about macro and micronutrient intake, and we just look at reducing calorie intake in adults, obese adults, and its effect on the microbiome, you've already heard the magic word short chain fatty acids and butyrate this morning, then you can see by, by just restricting somebody's calorie intake, we can actually change their microbiome and short chain fatty acid intake. But as we're starting off with obese adults, we also have to think about whether just changing their weight has got an effect on their microbiome um, outcomes other than just reducing their calorie intake. Going then to infants, and we look at the data from Lawson et al. Um, I think this study beautifully summarizes what we want to see, but also highlights questions that we're still not able to answer. As the infants were eating more fat in their diet, so did they, um, gut microbiome diversity measured by the Shannon index, so the alpha diversity decrease. As they were eating more fiber, again, as expected, so did their um, gut microbiome diversity increase, again, measured by the Shannon index. But as I always say to patients when I see them in clinic is, if you eat more of something, you've got to eat less of something else. And so it's very difficult to tease out whether the effect seen is very definite just relating to the fat intake, but perhaps whether fat intake was also associated with reduced fiber intake and vice versa. So um, many things we really need to focus on, but what I can say about this study is that the um, authors did actually look at overall diet intake in terms of family food. And so they didn't just give us a snapshot of just fat intake or just fiber intake or just protein intake. We did get an idea of how overall diet affected um, my gut microbiome outcomes. So then, you know, um, diet diversity, I feel a little bit lost this morning, not, not showing um, the diet diversity data from Caroline Ruday in my own because I, I seem to quote it quite often nowadays, but I'm not showing it. Um, because you've already heard that. And so we'll be looking at diet quality today. And I've now shown you some adult data, some infant data. And I'd like now to jump to the pregnancy diet because again, Dr. Ruby Pavankar beautifully highlighted some unknowns, particularly about the maternal diet in pregnancy and um, infant allergy outcomes. So, um, you know, I'm going to simplify a very complex presentation, asthma and wheeze in infancy into two simple slides. But as a lot of asthma is uh, driven by um, inflammation and wheeze in infancy often driven by um, inflammation, I wanted to look whether a more inflammatory diet in pregnancy um, is associated with more asthma or wheeze in the infants and whether a lower um, inflammatory diet in pregnancy was associated with reduced outcomes. And as you can see, we did get the association in unadjusted models, but it was heavily confounded by maternal weight. And so we lost the significant just yet in the adjusted models. But more on an immunological point of view, and Dr. O'Mahony is one of the co-authors on this paper, in my simple mind, I thought if moms eat a more inflammatory diet and I look at the cord blood cytokines, I'm gonna see a lot of um, inflammatory cytokines floating around. And we saw absolutely no association between maternal inflammatory diet and a cord blood cytokine um, outcomes. Um, so then, you know, we looked at healthy eating index. I'll let us show you quickly data on ages intake. And once again, we didn't find any association. So um, Liam already showed you the published data. I'm showing you the unpublished data up to two years of age, where we designed a diet in half of the cohort, then replicated it in the other half. And we found that a maternal diet rich in vegetables, yogurt, and lower in red meat, low fiber, sugary cereals, and fried foods, and fruit juice opposed to having fruit, 
um, was associated with 50% reduced odds of atopic dermatitis, 65% reduced odds of atopic wheeze, and 61% reduced odds of food allergy up to two. So the published data was, was up to four. I'm currently looking at um, the data on the microbiome, hence my silence during the previous discussion, and I'm hoping I'd be able to present some data in future. Um, then, you know, this is a busy slide data that um, I, 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 I invited um, a review I published in Allergy. Um, I just want to focus on food here and cooking methods and then also processing. So we think that cooking methods, especially dry cooking or frying, reducing advanced glycation end products may be associated with allergy outcomes. Um, definitely in children with current food allergy or current wheeze or asthma, there has been an association seen with higher intake of ages. And then emulsifiers in mouse model studies have also been associated with um, changes in the epithelial bladder and gut microbiome. So looking again at the maternal diet, um, well, first we look at the um, emulsifiers and the microbiota. Here you've got the mice model data, but then if you look at the human data, um, increase of um, emulsifier, in increase in intake um, also negatively affects the gut microbiome. So we really need to look at increased intake of how um, one of my other collaborators, Dr. Kanani, often referred to as junk food, but perhaps there is a concern about eating these foods too often. And then I wanted to look, I know that current intake of ages negatively is associated with allergy outcomes. I wanted to know whether ages intake in pregnancy can affect allergy outcomes in the infant. It took us 18 months to develop this age score, validate it, run it on the maternal data, and I have striking non-significant data. So it didn't seem that, you know, perhaps from a prevention point of view, just focusing on ages in pregnancy affect child allergy outcomes, and that the overall diet, as I've already shown you, is much more important than just single components of a diet. So future research, that's to summarize, we really need to look at baseline status of intake and baseline um, sera levels. We need to have well-designed well studies. We need to find measuring tools that can look at overall diet within the context of food allergen intake. I'm very excited that I've now developed such a tool, which I will be using um, in many of the studies already mentioned here this morning. And um, I'm validating the tool at the moment and we really need to bring expertise from many different professionals to make sense of this very complex term, immuno and nutrition or immunomodulation via nutrition. We have in a yucky group, if you want to join our group, um, Dr. Omoni and I got it established, I'm the current chair, and I thank you for your time and I'd be happy to discuss further during the question and answer session. Thank you very much, Dr. Venter, for this wonderful presentation, and uh, we will have discussion later on. Our last speaker is Dr. Koblin. She's from Murdoch Children's uh, Research Institute from, from Australia, and um, we will listen to her recorded talk about recent progress in food allergy prevention in Australia. Good morning and thanks very much, Kari, for the invitation to speak today about recent progress in food allergy prevention in Australia. I'm sorry for putting these slides up, but I'll go through them very quickly. I just wanted to point out, as everybody already knows, that we have very good evidence that earlier introduction of peanut can prevent peanut allergy very effectively, at least in the setting of RCTs. And this is the data that you've all seen from the LEAP study. And I just wanted to make three points here, which again are not news to anybody. But the thing about LEAP, obviously, was that it was conducted in high-risk infants. Those who had a skin big test of above four millimetres at study entry were excluded as they were likely to already have peanut allergy. And there were fairly strict criteria around how much peanut infants should be consuming. And some of these may not be replicated in the real world. At the time that LEAP was published, we did a little bit of modelling looking at what impact earlier introduction of peanut might have on the prevalence of peanut allergy 
if implemented in the general population. And we calculated that there could be a decrease in the population prevalence of peanut allergy of around 40 to 60 percent, depending on whether or not earlier introduction was also effective in lower risk infants, and to what extent those with the skin with just above four millimetres were already peanut allergic. Again, this is not news to everyone, anyone, but you will all know that earlier introduction of egg was also subsequently shown in um, meta-analyses of randomised controlled trials to also prevent egg allergy, possibly less effectively than early peanut introduction. And just the final piece of background to set the scene for what I'm going to be talking about today, I just wanted to show some of the history of Australian infant feeding guidelines, and these will be similar to what has been seen around the world. But around the 1990s, Australia started introducing guidelines recommending avoiding allergenic foods until one to three years of age. And at the time, avoidance of peanut in infancy became widespread. By around 2008, we were starting to remove this advice, but there wasn't any strong advice to introduce early at that point. And we did start to see a small shift towards earlier introduction of peanut around 2008, but most infants were still having delayed introduction of peanut beyond at least the first year. And this is data from the Health Nuts study showing in the blue line up the top that even around 2010, 2011, we still only had around 30% of infants introduced to peanut in the first year of life. Although that was a significant increase from what was happening around 2007 to 2008 in the yellow line bottom there. So what happened after LEAP? Well, Australia developed consensus infant feeding guidelines that involved stakeholders from a number of different organisations trying to get consistency in the advice that we were providing to parents across different organisations. And there were three main points that came out of this consensus process. The first was around introducing solids around six months. Most relevant to this presentation was that we were recommending that all infants should be given allergenic solid foods, including peanut butter in the first year of life, including those at high risk of allergy. And then hydrolyzed formula not recommended for the prevention of allergic disease. So in the last few years, we've been trying to measure the impact of these new infant feeding guidelines on infant feeding and peanut allergy in Australia. In 2017, I started the Early Nuts cohort to recruit around 2,000 infants and look at what had happened in 10 years since we'd initially recruited our first cohort, the Health Nut Study, before infant feeding guidelines changed. And I've just noted here in red that Health Nuts had a 3% prevalence of peanut allergy in the context of most parents delaying the introduction of peanut to their infants. Both studies had the same recruitment methods and sampling frames, so they're directly comparable. They were both conducted in the same region. Both were population-based samples of 12-month-old infants. Both included extensive questionnaires for parents, eczema assessments and skin break tests for infants and oral food challenges for any infants who were sensitised. So this is the first thing we saw, and we saw this a couple of years ago. But what was really great was that we were seeing a very high uptake of early peanut introduction, probably even higher than we were expecting. So in the early nut study in the red line, more than 80% of infants had had peanut in the first year of life. And there was a peak around six months, almost 50% of infants in early nuts had had peanut around six months of age. This was a huge change from what we'd seen in health nuts. This is the data that I showed you earlier in the blue lines below. And we also saw similar results in infants with eczema, which was very promising. The other thing that we noted was that there were some pretty major changes in the demographics of Melbourne over this time period. And one of the really important ones was that we had an increase in migration, which meant that we were seeing fewer parents, fewer families where both parents were born in Australia, and an increase in particular in families that had one or both parents born in East Asia. And the reason I point this out is because we trend previously the peanut allergy was over three times more common in those who had one or both parents born in Asia. Infant eczema, however, was fairly similar over this 10 year period after controlling for parent country of birth. Family history of food allergy was a little more common in early nuts, and this was what, pretty much what we were expecting. So, what happened to peanut allergy? Lots of uh, interesting things. So, I'll go through this fairly slowly. But if you have a look at the red line here, this shows essentially what we measured in health nuts on the left and then early nuts on the right. I mentioned already that the prevalence of peanut allergy in health nuts was 3%. In fact, the prevalence of peanut allergy that we saw in the early nut study was exactly the same, 3.1%. Uh, 
But as I've already said, there was an important change in demographics and we needed to control for that. So the green line shows what happens when we took that into account. We showed a small decrease in penalty after adjusting for um, changes in demographics and particularly for that change in migration that I talked about earlier. But this is still only a small decrease in peanut allergy, certainly not to the extent we're expecting. We calculated that as about a 17% decrease. And in fact, there was not really any significant evidence of a change in prevalence over that time period, which was certainly not what we were expecting. We also had a few pre-specified analyses that we did for this cohort. And one was to stratify by eczema. And what we found was that the decrease in peanut allergy was really seen only among infants with early onset eczema. So you can see uh, for the Kids with no eczema, there was not really any change in peanut allergy over time. For the kids with eczema, there was a decrease, and particularly after adjusting for demographic changes in the red boxes here. And as we expected, we saw that there was much higher prevalence of peanut allergy in those who had early onset eczema. We also stratified by parent country of birth. We saw, if anything, maybe a small decrease, although certainly not significant, in those who had both parents born in Australia and no decrease um, in those who had both one or both parents born in East Asia. And again, we explored this a little bit further to look at the relationship between timing of introduction of peanut and peanut allergy in our cohort. On the left-hand side here, you can see for both people with both parents born in Australia, especially in the early months cohort, so that's the solid circles, those who were introducing peanut earlier we're less likely to have peanut allergy, so exactly what we'd expect, exactly what was shown in the randomised control trials. We didn't see the same so much in health nuts, but that's because we didn't have a lot of people introducing early, so it was these really wide confidence intervals. We didn't have the power to look at that. What we weren't expecting was that we saw absolutely no association between timing of introduction of peanut allergy, of peanut and peanut allergy in those who had one or both parents born in East Asia. That's different to what was seen in LEAP. And that's still something that we're not quite sure why we weren't seeing that association and still exploring that. So does that mean that early introduction of peanut was not a really good recommendation? Well, certainly not. We also did some calculations to look at what might have happened to peanut allergy in Melbourne if timing of introduction hadn't changed. And so this is modelling that basically assumed that we saw the same demographics as we have currently in our early nuts cohort but we hadn't changed timing of peanut introduction. So most people were still delaying as we saw in health nuts. And our modelling showed that we would have expected to see a rise in peanut allergy over that time period without earlier introduction. So the estimates here, the health nuts again, 3.1% peanut allergy, up to potentially as high as 5% with low peanut introduction in our current setting. And this is the final results slide. And it's just really to point out that most reactions that we'd seen to peanut occurred on the first introduction of peanut, and they were mostly very mild. The reason I point out that most reactions occurred on the first introduction of peanut is because one of the things that we really wanted to look at was obviously the relationship between dose or amount of peanut and the number of occasions that people were eating peanut and peanut allergy. But because all the reactions tended to be happening early, on the first or second exposure, parents stopped giving the food quite appropriately, went to see the doctor and were often diagnosed with peanut allergy. So they weren't really able to keep consuming in the way that we would have, would have thought might have been protective. So a couple of conclusions. The prevalence of peanut allergy in Melbourne was unfortunately still high, despite fantastic uptake of early peanut introduction. We did see a small but non-significant decrease in the prevalence of peanut allergy after controlling for demographic changes over the past 10 years. And the decrease in peanut allergy appeared to be greater among infants with early onset eczema. We conclude really that early introduction of peanut is certainly necessary, certainly recommended, but not sufficient by itself to eliminate peanut allergy. And there's a number of trials that I'm sure you've heard about that um, I can talk a little bit more about later if you like, looking at other ways that might prevent peanut allergy in, or, and other food allergies in our population. I'm just pointing out here that for our population, at least the East Asian migrants are really an important group to target for food allergy prevention strategies. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much, Dr. Kaplan, and um, for this wonderful talk. So now we can start to discuss. Um, and uh, I can see 
One question related to the non-IgE uh, food allergy. So do Dr. Sapman is asking when is over non-IgE uh, mediated multiple food allergy. So if anyone would like to discuss on this or answer the question. So is the question, when do children outgrow multiple non-IgE food allergies? Yes, exactly. Um, I think the complexity of that answer is, is what we're talking about for non-IgE. Uh, is he referring to mild to moderate enteropathies, FIs, EOE? You know, if it's multiple food allergies with EOE, I'd say unlikely that they will outgrow it. FIs really depending on which population you look at. Perhaps by three, most likely by five, but we've now seen from the latest data from Richie Gupta that some of these children actually continue to have if by symptoms, even though we thought that most outgrow it by five. Um, the mild to moderate ones, one normally we would say, two at the latest, but so I'm not sure if I answer that, but I really think it just depends what this, what particular presentation of non-IGE food allergies you're referring to. I don't know if anybody else wants to add anything to that. I think it was an excellent answer. So we don't have written questions, but I have a couple of questions to discuss here. For example, um, for the Liam, what do you think Liam about the uh, probiotics? Because um, Definitely, we need novel probiotics because of the risk to have or to use only one type of. What do you think about? Would you like to discuss more? What could be the novel ones? Yeah, thank you, Mubachal. I think we need to be more prescriptive and a bit more clever in the way that we do this. You know, I, I there was a question earlier about you know testing for you know the presence of strains. And I think you know, we should guide our probiotic therapies the same way. So, you know, we can have a list of 10 probiotics that might be good, but there's really, you know, screen the kids first, find out which ones they're missing, and then give those. And that will, you know, give a much higher chance of giving a benefit uh, rather than just simply giving one strain to everybody. It doesn't make much sense to do that, I think. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you very much, Liam. Um, I also have another concern about the, you know, when um, the people can um, uh, consume the, the food or nutrition, but they cannot really eat them in isolation. So then the, the intake of one food or one nutrient can actually prevent to or um, reduce the effect of another one or dietary uh, diversity could be challenged, right? What do you think? Because the, the food is not really um, only one single uh, nutrients having. So can, can we discuss about this? How difficult uh, it will be in the future to look at the, the effect of single uh, nutrients if they block intake of others? So maybe Kalina is better to answer this one. Yeah. But uh, Liam, you can you can uh, get in as well. And when I stop answering, I do have a question for um, Jen. Um, but what I want to say is, I, I don't know how easy it is going to, to study it. I love working with very clever statisticians that help me to untease these things. But one of the things I do want to say is that when we just look at simple healthy eating in pregnancy, simple healthy eating in infancy, it doesn't seem to be associated with reduced allergy outcomes, which tell me that there's got to be some combination of nutritional factors that may not necessarily be considered to be standard healthy eating that can prevent allergy. And that was what we were trying to do with the paper published in Allergy, looking at the maternal diet. Now, there's flaws in that paper too, like fish, you know, is missing, strikingly missing, but it is because nobody in Denver eats fish. So I couldn't really get an idea between high and low fish intake. So I think, you know, we've, we've got a simple index, which of course I'm proud of. I, I think, you know, it can be better when we get more diversity in women's intake than what we might have seen in Denver. But um, I also think that, and this may be very hard to study as well, and probably not in the next two decades, when we currently look at intake of 
uh, calcium, let's say healthy healthy guidelines, let's pretend of calcium. We look, it's based on bone density, but perhaps there's a different level of sufficient calcium intake for allergy outcomes. And so I think as we're moving more towards precision medicine, um, we need to think about that. Uh, I know that you, Dr. Actors and um, Chesma as well, is very interested in emulsifiers, but in terms of healthy eating, it probably doesn't matter if you have commercial food every now and then, it's pretty much part of what we as dietitians would suggest healthy eating is. But that may not work for allergy prevention, particularly in children where we worried about the epithelial barrier of the gut and skin. So I'm not sure I answered you that, but I think the short answer is it's complex and we yeah. need much more data. Yes, yes, indeed. So, so I have one question uh, from Jesme and uh, he asks, do you think early introduction studies should be considered together with the gut barrier leakiness of the baby? And uh, he gives an, an example of the study of Olympia in JACI shows the importance of Staphylococcus aureus colonization in the success of early intervention. So then uh, Staphylococcus aureus colonization could be a marker of barrier leakiness. It may be relevant to measure barrier leakiness to decide for early intervention in the future studies. I think it, um, I mean, everyone can make a suggestion on it. I'll let Liam take that one. <laughs> I mean, it's clear that the barrier is is hugely important. And and I think, you know, they all go together, don't they? You know, having, you know, an increased microbial diversity with a diverse diet, you know, leads to an improvement in barrier. So they're all really well connected. And by measuring barrier, it gives a good uh, measure probably of the other features as well. But I think biologically barrier uh, development early in life is really, really important. Can I ask a question to Jen, if, if yes. I'm allowed? So, hi Jen, lovely to see you. I, sorry if I've missed this from your talk, but what I clearly got was that despite early introduction, peanut allergy rates are not going down as we were hoping. And then Ruchi uh, Gupta showed in her data that in the parents in America where they do introduce peanut early, the majority give it a few times a month when we, think at least currently, it's weekly intake that's important and more than once weekly perhaps. So do you have data in Australia where they're, even though they introduce it early, they not introduce it high enough dose frequently enough? Do you think that's the issue? Yeah, so we definitely have that data and that was initially what we thought. What we found when we started exploring it a little bit further was that actually, unfortunately, most of the people who turned out to be peanut allergic had reacted on their first or second exposure. So they never managed to get up to those sort of regular consumptions and high doses. So I think, yes, they're not consuming it to the extent. So we recommend two or three times a week in Australia. And we've certainly not seen many people getting up to that. But certainly the ones who were on to develop allergy aren't really able to get there because they do seem to react fairly early on. Um, so I think that's what we really need to sort of explore a little bit further. So whether or not it's, you know, some of those reactions that we're seeing may be a very, I mean, a lot of them are very mild. So if they have a little bit of erythema or a few hives, can they continue in some form to continue eating? Is that beneficial? We don't really know that. Um, so I'd say it's possibly part of the answer, but, but for us, it's, it's not just a matter of increasing our recommendations around how often they're eating it, because as I say, they, sort of, they, they stop for fairly good reasons and they do go off and they see their doctor and then they see their allergist and then they end up having a peanut allergy. So Jen, I have also another question regarding the, the peanut allergy where you showed that the, the, um, the intro, introduction time you suggest as early as possible, although the data was not supporting, but what do you think from food to food, the introduction time uh, of the food should be different or what do you think about this? Yeah, so I, I mean, I, I think so. I mean, for egg, for example, egg, I, yes. I think, you know, before 12 months, maybe okay for peanut, but, uh, you know, or four to 11 months, um, but certainly for egg, I think probably would need to be a little bit earlier. And certainly everyone in our cohorts is eating before 12 months and always was. So I think that's not going to be the answer. And we did see a little bit of a shift towards more introduction around six months of egg as well. Um, but we haven't looked at all our egg data yet. So we're going to, to, we're going to do that next. But I think certainly it will, it, 
there's some differences between those two foods and then milk is the other one obvious one know. again maybe Karina might, wants to add something to that but I think I think there probably are some differences between those three at least I don't know when we get to things like tree nuts I think we just don't know enough um, but I suspect you know that that may be more like peanut but that's a complete guess at this point for me so thank you very much. And the, is there anything else you would like to also discuss here? Anything uh, in your mind? Okay, so we don't have any questions. I thank you all for your uh, brilliant and uh, perfect presentations and uh, I enjoyed a lot. So I would like to also invite uh, Dr. Nadal to give her closing speech. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. And thank you for those of you who are in Asia and Australia, where it is quite early in the morning. And we really appreciate uh, your being here today. And thank you for the excellent talks for everyone and for the people that are participating as uh, participants and registrants. You've made wonderful contributions in the questions. Um, I want to make sure all of you know this is recorded you will get a link to the full recording of the three hours. And in addition, uh, we'll make sure that if you have any further questions on anyone here that has given a talk, we wanna make sure that we provide you answers from the experts. So we will be um, emailing any further questions to them to see if they have time to answer and we can provide you references as well. So I only have three slides. You have all been wonderful and very patient. And I'm really excited to be able to talk to you today about the future of food allergy prevention with um, the rest of this preeminent group. And I always like to think about things in terms of historical information. And I found this online, which was Michelangelo's shopping list that he gave to um, one of his team members to go shopping for him. And you can see it has nuts, uh, peanuts in particular, as well as wheat and fish and milk and eggs. And I just find this interesting because in the 1500s, of course, um, there were no food allergies, or at least we don't know of any. And here we are now in our current century in which environments are different different now as well as genetics. And you've heard today about a lot of different potential causes of food allergy and a lot of that research has now allowed us to think about prevention. So we need to understand history, but we need to understand currently what our patients are dealing with now so that we can think about prevention so that we can get back to times when people did not have to live in fear of food allergies. And if you have any questions or feedback on today or need link to the recording, please feel free to email me and my email is there. I really wanna thank Tina Nguyen for organizing this and the moderators and the speakers for all the work they've done behind and on the scene today to make this a success. And then finally, I just wanna point out that Compared to five years ago, there are many more clinical trials now in food allergy prevention. That's thanks to a lot of you here today. The opportunity is ours to perform more research, to understand best practices and mechanisms to better target prevention. And community-based participation, shared decision-making, sharing data, transparent communication like we've had today, and consistent processes are key to be able to really find out the best ways to prevent any one individual like Dr. Venter said, decision prevention. And more research and education is needed and conferences like this is one of many. And I just want to highlight the fact that all of these conferences are coming up this next year. I hope you'll all join the APACI, Dr. Poankar mentioned, APACI, uh, it, which will be the American College meeting, ASKIA in Australia, our Canadian colleagues, IAKI in Europe, the Gordon Research Conference in Ventura, California this January, and then PAM, uh, which is the pediatric allergy meeting that is held by IAKI. So I want to thank you all, and uh, I'll stop there. We appreciate your coming today. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. <laughs>